السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أسعد الله صباحكم بالخير جميعا وأحب أرحب في جميع الحضور وأرحب كذلك بالبروف مروان أبو رأس معكم أخوكم الدكتور فهد القحطاني أنا استشاري في إصلاح وتجميل الأسنان ومدير مركز كاشت وحقيقة سعادتي اليوم في أنه نحب من خلالكم أن نرحب بالبروف مروان أبو رأس وفي نفس الوقت نبي نأكد للجميع بأنه مركز كاشت صحيح أنه بدأ في مرحلة كورونا وما تخللها من بعض الأوبستكلس ولكن نبي نأكد على شغلة مهمة أنه مركز كاشت يهدف إلى توصيل العلم والمعلومات الصحيحة في وقت يعني نجد فيه شح في اللكتشرز والانفورميشن الميديكال انفورميشن الصحيحه والقويه في نفس الوقت. في هذا الصباح ارحب بالجميع واللي يعني صراحه احنا سعيد جدا بهذا العدد الكبير وفي نفس الوقت نرحب بالبروف مروان ابو راس والبروف مروان ابو راس يعني علم فوقه نار وهذا العلم لم ياتي بكلمه من فهد القحطاني واللي انا بالنسبه لي افتخر اني كنت احد طلبه الدكتور مروان واستفدت الكثير واكثر من 130 الى 140 طبيب على مستوى المملكه من كذلك خريجين الدكتور وهم كلهم الان اعلام وماسكين مناصب جيده سواء في الدوله او في الجفرم في البرايفت سيكتور البروف مروان جميعنا نعلم انه هو من هو استاذ في جامعه ساوث كاليفورنيا ومؤسس برامج التدريس والتعليم العليا في جامعه ساوث كاليفورنيا سواء الاي جي دي او الاندودونتك او وقبلها البروستودونتك ماسترز اند اذر بروجرامز ولما في 1998 تقريبا افتتح مركز او معهد الامير عبد الرحمن بن عبد العزيز في القوات المسلحه مستشفى القوات المسلحه وما وما يعني كان له سبب كبير جدا في تطور الحركه العلميه في المملكه العربيه السعوديه وما تبع ذلك من كثير من النشاطات اللي البروف مروان ما زال يقوم بها حتى هذه اللحظه الدكتور مروان يعني ابى الا انه حتى مع ظروف كورونا ان يكون متواجد من خلال الاونلاين وان كان ان شاء الله تزول هذه الغمه ويكون اللقاء يعني وجها لوجه ان شاء الله قريبا وانا بس في هذه اللحظات مع ترحيبنا بالبروف مروان ودي اكد انه كاشت يقوم حاليا بترتيب كثير من البرامج اللي تهم معظم اطباء الاسنان سواء الطبيب العام او المتخصص في العصب او غيره من التخصصات الاخرى. جميعنا نرحب بالبروف مروان ابو راس ولا ودي اطيل كثير صراحه ومتمنين لكم ان شاء الله الفائده العظمى. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد سيد المرسلين. دكتور فهد شكرا. الحقيقه ما كنت اتوقع المقدمه هذه المفروض اني ابدا بالبرنامج فخر الي ان تكون معنا اليوم وهذه اول مره الحقيقه وي ار اون لاين برزنتينج سوتش بروجرام اوكي ناو اي جو باك تو انجلش دكتور فهد تاتشت اون فيري امبورتنت ثينكس از ذا كواليتي اوف ايديوكيشن ذات يو ار ريسيفينج نورمالي اور يو هاف هاد ريسيفد and you will receive. At least I will limit myself today to something very important. I want you to know that this material today is prepared just for you. Your eyes will be the first eyes to see some of these slides and to hear some of these ideas that I'm gonna share with you today. I'm passionate about education. I'm passionate about dental education. I'm passionate about general practitioners get the best education because they are the spine of dentistry. 
And that's really what I'm trying to do today is share with you some of my biases, some of the things I believe in to my core. So why this program today? Why I put it today? Let me tell you the story. We can start now. I'm gonna focus on issues today that's close to you in your education and your practice. The master diagnostician was a course we gave back in January. The title was how to become a master diagnostician. And then after that, after that course, I gave a series, I put together a series on surgical endodontic series. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? I did that because I feel something wrong and something has to be said, something has to be done. And that's what it is. Basically, Dr. Basim Jazairi is one of my residents and today he's an endodontist and he's at the military hospital, one of the best people I have trained. He completed his studies in Vancouver, Canada. Basim, on December 21st, 2020, sent me this x-ray. This is an x-ray. And he said, with that x-ray, he said, Amrul Marida, 19. The age of this patient is 19 years. The central was extracted, the place, the alveolus was destroyed just because healing after the root canal did not take place. And then he said, he was treating patients, he said, I will give you the details later. This is the story of a 19 years old Saudi girl, a patient. She went through orthodontic treatments, as you could see. Apparently, one of these teeth, this one right here, to, okay, I'm going to speak the American system. This tooth here, number nine, had endodontic problem and had a root canal treatment. Apparently, the treatment the first time did not work. Apparently, the patient went back and she received more root canal. You could see she was still in orthodontic retainers. So she received more root canals. And apparently the problem remained. And then what happened? The patient, unfortunately, ended up with a young periodontist who decided this is the solution. This is the solution. As if there is nothing called surgical endodontics, as if there is nothing called retreatment, the tooth was condemned, and with it was condemned the bone. And now we have huge defect. You can see here the distance between the root end and the floor of the nose is only 10 millimeters. For some reason, you can see now this is the floor of the nose, and I do have some communication here. This is a 19 years old young woman, and this is her scan. You could see the defect. The point I'm trying to make in endodontic teeth and centrals are supposed to be the easiest thing to treat in endo. As a matter of fact, some universities teaching only centrals. And do you know that the maxillary centrals, the lateral incisor, is the second tooth I do endodontic surgery on, the second tooth after the first molar. Do you know that in implant dentistry, the most difficult piece to replace in implant dentistry, okay, is the central incisors and why they are extracted? Because endodontic treatment failure and sometimes because of trauma. But it's always endodontic did not work or the post caused fracture. Okay, so we continue the story. Basim also, just a few months ago, sent me this case. You could see this 
is a critical size defect, which I'm going to talk about today. Today, you're going to hear terms you did not hear before, and I will explain them. But this is a case that Dr. Basim Jazairi did, and he said, five months only. I said, beautiful, Basim. You could see now the repair. So endodontic treatment works in every hand, every trained hand. Every person who is well-trained can do endo successfully and excellence. But it's not being done. We are back, back to the 50s. When the treatment doesn't work, we extract. There's so many things you're going to learn today that endodontists can help the patient through you. Okay, so this is another case Basim sent me. He sent me this and he said, this is done one of the best endodontists in the country, in the city, whatever. When I look at this tooth here and I see this implant and I see this perforation and I see this lesion, to me, this unfinished treatment even though the patient has no symptoms, this is not an endodontist work, okay? It's not even a GP work if the GP is well-trained. So this is unfinished, and that's the essence, the essence, the core, the idea of the treatment finalization, which I developed and I talk about, and we explain, and you'll know more about it today. So today we have a lot of general practitioners, we have dental students, and this is what I'm trying to do here is share with you some of my thoughts and tell you, I taught residents, I trained about 170 American and international endodontists at USC throughout the years. I was at USC for about 30 years, then I came here, we've been here almost 20 years, or 20 years actually. I used to tell my residents, doctors, the x-ray you finish, the x-ray if you are an endodontist, you send to your referring dentist. Or if you are a general practitioner, the x-ray you take for your crown and bridge, for your root canal, for your surgery is your signature. This doctor signed this way, this is his signature. And this is the signature of the person who put this post. And this is the signature of the doctor who basically placed this post in this beautiful root canal. Beautiful root canal, horrible post. And this is the signature of the endodont person who did the root canal, the person who did the three posts. You can see that. So get this concept. The concept is somebody, somewhere, are going to see your, your work, whether you are a specialist or a GP. And from here, we come to the next level, and that is to do the best we can for the first time. And you don't finish the job. You do not dismiss the patient with a tooth like this. And this is why I say always take an x-ray before the patient leaves. So that took me to a relationship, something I, I wasn't planning to talk about this this course, but I'm, this is an introduction for your whole day today. This is why I put material together for you today. This relationship between the specialist and the generalist is very important. The GP. The GP is the core of dentistry. In America, in the United States, there are 180,000 general practitioners, 180,000 dentists. Only from them, 43,000 are specialists. About 12,000 orthodontists, about 9,000 maxillofacial, 4,000 endo, 4,000 stereo, okay? Pedodontist, about 8,000. Prostodontist is going down, only about 1,000. 
But that's not the issue. The issue is the GP. I am here for the GP. I trained the specialists to serve the general practitioners. This is the philosophy that I don't understand. When you have more specialists than generalists, there is something wrong. So as a GP, what to refer, when to refer, what to expect from your endodontist or from your periodontist, from your oral surgeon, from your orthodontist. You need the specialist to give you feedback about your patient. Specialists here do not give feedback to their general practitioners. General practitioners send cases. I never, I send cases to doctors. I never heard from them again. And I hear some doctors tell me when they refer a patient, they never get the patient back. This is sad. But that's my job today. I'm not going to do that. In my opinion, the general practitioner is our target. He or she should be the person that the best education is directed to. The general practitioner do the core of dentistry, endo, perio, resto. This is the heart, this is the core. Everything else is paraphernalia, additional. This, the general practitioner, practitioner should be this, the ambassador for a good specialist. They build their name. They say, the good doctors, good endodontists, good periodontists, I'm going to send you to them. They are the best. And therefore, he should expect the patient back with the best treatment possible. Now, what about the specialist? The specialist wants to know what the general practitioner wants, what to do. And they need, the specialist must give feedback to the general practitioner. They must thank the general practitioner. Thank you for referring this patient. If you have a questions, you call them. And when you finish the treatment, you send them back. Say, I have done this, this, and this, and we have this complication, and this is what I'm going to do. They refer back the patient to the general practitioner, and they are the ambassador for the general practitioners. They should tell their patient, your general practitioner, your dentist is the best in town. I am so happy to work with him. I'm so glad to be his specialist in endo, in ortho, in surgery, in perio. And the specialist must follow up. So when you do these things, okay, then you need to compare what's happening with you or when you work. This is why I am talking today the way I am talking. This is a patient was done excellent treatment by an endodontist here in town. He wanted or she wanted to do, and they did the post, but the patient needed crown lengthening. Send it to a periodontist who decided to do this. And after doing that, send that. And all of this done without notification of the general practitioner or the endodontist. So the general practitioner who told me the story, he asked about his patient and this is what happened. They put an implant, extracted the tooth implant. So there's no communication between GP and specialist or even between specialists themselves. So cases like that make me think there is something wrong in the education of general dentists. This is a case by an oral surgeon who decided to do epicoectomy without a retrofilling. Of course she couldn't because you have a post. I understand that. This is a substandard endodontics. I understand that. The apex here is only size 25. That's 250 micron. And when you cut the root about the mid root, this is now size two millimeters, okay? So when I see cases like that done by an or by or a surgeon doing endo correction, I feel they should know more about endo. They should know more about surgical endo because surgical endo is different from this oral surgery endodontics. 
or this case. This is, wasn't done here, fortunately. This was done actually in Los Angeles. And this was sent to me by Dr. Adet Bahar, one of the most excellent periodontists in LA. And I am a reviewer for a journal of implantology. I just reviewed an article about the survival of the post of the implant next to teeth. So they're worrying about the survival of the implant. There's no worry about what happened to this tooth. Well, I got news for you. From that research, which I just reviewed, 19, 16 to 19% of the teeth adjacent to implants becoming devitalized. They lose vitality. Yes, you could do endo. But you know that this endo is now affecting the implant. This pathology here is going to go retro and is going to affect the implant. So the person who put this implant apparently didn't even know dental anatomy. Okay. So when you see these things, it makes you think there is something need to be done. This is why I put the first course. The first course in the series I did it specially for the specialist to communicate. For oral surgeon, periodontist, implant dentist, surgeon should know about surgical endodontics. And this is why I put those four or five courses. To give an idea about what a surgeon and periodontist know about the other specialty in endodontics. That was our first course. Another course we gave about master diagnostician. And in that we taught the 4R operational diagnosis system, which I use in everything I do in teaching in education. And this is the system that I did at Prince Abdurrahman Advanced Dental Institute. This is the same system we did at USC. All endodontists I trained at USC, they use the 4R system in endodontic diagnosis. All the advanced education general dentistry resident, general practitioner, advanced general practitioner use this system in treatment of patients. The four hour operational diagnosis. We presented this in the first course we did. I'm not going to go in details, but it's a very important comprehensive system. It, it basically depends on symptoms, radiograph, pulp testing, period testing, and then open the tooth and see what's going on. And then we also talk about endodontic treatment finalization, a very important concept. It's a lot to do with what we do today. And that's a publication I did back, treatment finalization at California back in 19, 1993. It's 27 years ago. And I have to tell you, I just read it again. It's the best thing I have ever written. And I will write it again, even with a stronger language even with stronger language, because it's needed today more than ever. And you'll see why. To do it right the first time is your goal. Because you know why? There may not be a second time. There may not be a second time to do the job better. The patient may go somewhere else. The patient may move. The patient, who knows? And this is the system, the endodontic treatment finalization. In this system today, for the first time, some of you seeing this, I'm gonna give you just the core of it. You basically have steps. You start with the four R diagnosis. Based on that, you decide, are you gonna keep the tooth? Is the tooth hopeless? You do interim endo. The tooth absolutely need extraction. You extract and you get out. But if it's treatable, you do the endo necessary. If the endo is fine, then you could exit. But if the endo is finished and you don't have enough, we could do the buildup. And that could be the end. If not, then you go to surgery. And then from surgery, you wait three, four months for healing, two months, and you do the final restorations and then recall. Now, this is a protocol 
you must go one, two, three, four, five, six. And the patient is informed about these six steps. When I first got to USC many years ago, we had 26 faculty part-time. They were teaching gutta percha, hot gutta percha, cold gutta percha, vertical condensation, lateral condensation, silver point, chloroperca, and each one teaching a different technique. The students were confused. The patients were not happy. And then we go to graduate education with the same situation. We needed standardization because they were going one surgery and then they do the endo. They go and put crown. And then the tooth needs endo. You do the endo, oh, now we have surgery. No, that's not acceptable. Today, this is the time of evidence-based dentistry. We know everything about biology. We know everything about dentistry today. And we know what works, what doesn't work. We have enough specialties we could get the education, the standards from. And this is what we say, you must go system by system. This is what we followed at USC and at PADI. Prince Abdurrahman Advanced Dental Institute. After that, I gave a course on basic surgery. That was May 22nd. And we focused on the first thing you do to your patient before the surgery. There's a protocols I follow. And the most important thing that I do not prescribe, I don't do any of these traditional, conventional, triangular flap, semilunar flap, trapezoidal flap, I don't do that, okay? And we have basically taught our techniques in that course that was done on 22nd of May. We talk about from A to Z, the whole thing. And even whether you have different types of flaps, we also discuss that. And we introduced the flap, which is so important. We do only one flap, full intracellular muco full intracellular anterior, full intracellular anterior, FIA, and full intracellular posterior. So you need that information for today's information when I talk in the course today. So that's important. And what we mean by full, it means it has the, the mucosa on the gingiva, it has the gingiva, it has the periosteum. All three of them are reflected. We do not do split thickness. We don't do all partial thickness. We basically talk about full. So you understand by the word full. Full means the gingiva, the mucosa attached to it, and the periosteum with it. These are important terms for today's lecture. And here, and so on. So, we also talked about vertical incisions, and that is not. Then after that, we did one week on, actually, we did a demonstration on a patient in the Cachet Center, Dr. Fed uh, Clinics, and we treated a patient there. We treated a patient, as was attended some the doctors, very, very nice group we had. And so we come to today. We come today, why this course for you today? Why are you doing what I'm doing now? It's because of this. This is in Riyadh. This doctor who decided to pull, extract, the most important tooth in the oral cavity, the canine, 28 to 32 millimeters long, the eye tooth, it's a stone, it's a cornerstone of the cosmetics. The cornerstone of mastication is extracted to do this. And when this fail to do that, unacceptable, unacceptable. I come from a generation, the 70s, 80s, 90s, 
we did a lot of endo to save teeth. We didn't have implants. Then implants came in the late 80s. You know, I, I took a course in implant. And the more implant courses I took, the more I loved the endo, the more I respected the endo, the more I am glad I am an endodontist. And you'll see why today. When you see that, so the education this doctor received is incomplete education. It's criminal what this patient received. And this patient is a VIP I know personally. For this, a recent graduate was shown exactly like this. He said, we pull, we extract. We don't want to do crown like filling and endo. Implant is better. So we're going to do that. That is incomplete education. This is a dangerous education. Dangerous education, because you will see today what I mean in specifics. So we come to today. This is our course today. It's a surgical management of problems in endodontics, periodontics. And what I basically, my message to you is, this is what endodontic can do. Endodontics, modern endodontics, good endodontist, a well-trained specialist, a well-trained general practitioner. I train general practitioner, they do surgery. I train general practitioner, they do retreatment. And this is the problem I have with the specialist. My target is general practitioners. My target is to serve who could serve others. That is the general practitioner. The general practitioner is the captain of the ship, is the leader. They should know everything about specialties. But they don't have to practice it. But they should know what is ideal, what is expected, what they are expecting from a good specialist. So a good trained specialist, and you could be the one, if you take courses, you prove yourself, into the, there's 10 things endodontists can do. Of course, you know about treatment, retreatment, surgery. This is what we did. We caused four courses in that. There's a lot, there's more to surgery in endo than a retrofit. I don't even do retrofits. Okay? There's more to surgical endodontics than epicoectomy and retrofilling. We do root embedding. Just a week ago, I did two root embedding. Basically, I did the root canals. One of them was a bicuspid. The other one was a canine. You totally gone. Okay. I did the root canal, sealed them, reduced them, and covered the gingiva on top to save the bone. To save the bone. The minute the root is gone, the bone is gone. And when the bone is gone, everything collapses. Intentional replantation, we're going to do today. So we're going to see these things today from here down. Intentional replantation, I'm going to cover a brand new concept for you. Very important, interim surgical endodontics. You're going to really appreciate that. That's what we're going to do this morning. And then this morning also, we're going to go through hemisection of molars and amputation, root amputation also of molars, or could be a combination of the above. A good generalist should know all about that because that's what she or he, as a general practitioner, can ask the general, the dentist to do, I mean, the specialist to do for them. And if you're a specialist, if your endodontist cannot do surgery, he or she is not a specialist. I am saying that again, because by definition, endodontics is surgical and non-surgical. And part of surgical endodontics is intentional, replantation, hemisection, root amputation, and emergency care. All right. So let's go. Let's go up to the first 
presentation for today. From now on, really the course, that was an introduction for today's. And the first hour I'm going to talk to you now about is a very important procedure that is root amputation and hemisection. I summarize them as H and A, hemisection and amputation. The problem is furcation. So I'm going to give you a concept. This is brand new material for you. And I put it together because it augment, it supports my philosophy about endodontic surgery can help. Okay, when there is a problem, you don't extract. There's so many options, and that's what I'm trying to say. So what's a furcation? Furcation, of course, you know what it is. It's an anatomic area in a multi-rooted tooth where the roots diverse. And basically, it's, it's, it's an organ. It has an entrance, a trunk length, root, concavities inside the roots, enamel projection of the person. Now, in period, they don't call them furcation lesion, they call them furcation invasion. The invasion is a pathologic resorption of the bone within the furcation. So I could use the term as the American Academy of Periodontists say, this is the way they define this. I call them lesions, furcation lesions. So according to the best definition, Ham, Nyman, and Lindy, back in 1975, they classified furcation into three groups or three levels. Class one, right here. It's a horizontal bone loss, less than three millimeter. The degree two, our class two, is horizontal bone loss, more than three millimeters, but not encompassing the total width of the vacation. So you still have some intact bone inside and you have some destruction beginning. And then you have class three, as you can see here, basically according to these are the most important authorities in the field. I consider Lindy is to me the father, the current father of periodontist, Lindy is what you see here, it's through and through. You can put the perioprobe in the buckle, it goes from the lingual. So through and through furcation in periodontal tissue, gone. So now two things I want you to, two concepts I want to convey to you, that in the lower teeth, the molars have basically buccal lingual furcation. In the upper molars, you have buccal, mesial, and distal. So when you have a disease in the, in the mandibular molars, okay, the frication problem, the period doesn't spill over to the adjacent teeth, stays right within the frication and destroys it. But in the upper, which is more dangerous, more serious to the patient, when you have a frication from the buccal, it spreads and goes through the mesial and affect the bicuspids, for the next molar, it goes to the distal and affect the second molar, as you could see here. So this buccal infrication went and destroyed the distal bone here to the molar and destroyed some of the mesial. Here, frication destroyed here and there. Look at this one. The frication, you have, again, you can see it's evolving. So the, the frication in the maxillary molars is, is bad news, especially the second molar. Okay, and these concepts are very important when we talk about root amputation or even endodontic treatment. Now, let me give you some concept about root trunk, root length trunk. You can see now right from the CEJ, cemento enamel junction, right here, right there, to the furca, right this distance, right here, is called root trunk trunk length. Okay, root, trunk, length. And that's very important to know 
when we talk about amputation or hemisection. This here is a very long root trunk length, according to this excellent study was done in Italy. And this is the short one. Ocean Bean, one of the giant, God rest his soul, from Seattle, Ocean Bean, Clifford Ocean Bean, did the classification for the uh, for case in osseous surgery, osseous surgery. And he basically have them into three groups. Long root, long root length, short length, and medium. And it's about, the, the short one is only about two to three millimeters. And then when you have that, you really have, it's very close to the oral environment and you have target periodontal disease fast. The long one is different, but these we cannot do amputation. These we can do amputation here. We could remove this root, okay? Here, it's too deep. And you always have to do crown lengthening when you do that, any type of amputation. All right. So you can see here what I'm talking about. The frication here did not affect the interproximal zones. Same thing here, but here, okay, <coughs> we have two kinds of diseases. This is localized horizontal bone loss, but this is very advanced, very chronic. This, this problem here didn't come from this furca, did not spill over because you basically have cortical bone here closing it. Okay, so some terms, root resection, I'm gonna call it root amputation. This is the term I used all my life, and hemisection. Root amputation mostly for upper teeth, molars, upper molars, multi-rooted teeth. I've done some uh, hemisection on the upper, as you will see today, but learn this. Amputation for uppers, hemisection for lower molars, multi-rooted. Together, I call them H and A. H and A, hemisection and amputation. All right. This is the concept, which is very important. This is the cemento enamel junction. This is the furcation. From here to there is root trunk length. Okay. I just put this because I, I want you to know the first bicuspid is the most difficult tooth to do surgery on, especially because of the concavity. Here we get perforations in endo and you cannot do any sections here or any kind of amputation. And you can see the difficulty we have. From here to there is nine millimeters. So the first bicuspid have nine millimeters to root trunk. This is short trunk. This is long trunk. This one, you can see periodontal disease quick. Here we can do amputation. We have a lot of bone. Okay, you could remove this half of the tooth and you still have the other half. Here, you can't. So when you see this here, the trunk, you, you can. So here I have a solution. I call it deep epicoectomy. I do surgery. I cut half of the root, but I still have a lot of bone supporting. This one is contraindicated for another reason. Two reasons this tooth cannot be done any type of hemisection or root amputation. First is deep trunk. And second, root proximity. There's no bone here. These roots are you can see them kissing each other. They, sometimes they do actually meet. So you don't have enough bone for the future. The same thing you have here. So I'm showing you this example because I'm going to go through the technique so you understand it later. All right. So according to Ocean Beam, I said in, in six, he has short, medium, and, and long. The long one, it could be five millimeters. Medium is about three or four. This one about two to three, okay? The best one for hemisection is the short trunk. But this is when you get a perforation here. If somebody perforated this furcation, finished. You need to do hemisection. I don't care what kind of material you use. 
I've tried everything. And the only answer is hemisection. All right. Here, if I perforate, no problem. It's away from the oral cavity. You see, you have a long distance for the bacteria at the oral cavity. So if you have a perforation here, it can be repaired. Okay. So now let's talk about root amputation. This material is extremely important and I hope it's new for you. So root amputation, hemisection, HNA, is not an endo procedure, it's a perio procedure. HNA was 100% in periodontal specialty for the management of furcation problems. There's so many ways to treat the furca, tunneling, get surgeries, but the most efficient way, okay, was hemisection or root amputation to get rid of the problem of furcation. So a lot of, many times the procedure was not expected. So you have the surgeon, the periodontist going into surgery and then find out he can't save, he cannot do osseo because everything is destroyed. So they decided to do what? They do root amputation during the surgery. It was unexpected. At that time, they called, they do it and they dismiss the patient. Patient has no symptoms. As you heard me talking about, don't ask your patient, do you have pain or not? There's no pain in dentistry. There's no pain in the early stages of any disease, caries, pulpitis. They don't hurt in the beginning. When they hurt, it's too late. It's very advanced to handle. And that's the issue here. So this guy amputated the mesiobacca root. Patient had no pain. So they started doing it. But later on, this is back in the 80s and 90s, when they started doing this, you can see this today, okay? Then they learned from that. So it's a periodontal procedure. Now, we in endo, we call them endodontic root amputation. Endodontic hemisection. We put the word endodontic, endohemi, endoamputation, purposely, and I will explain why. So this is bad. This is not acceptable. Why it's not acceptable, Dr. Aboraz? I'm going to tell you why. Let's use the same tooth. The first error, in endodontics, we remove the crown portion above the root that's removed. So this tissue here, this root structure, has to go with the root. So the dentist here did not remove, or the periodontist did not remove the coronal portion associated with the much, much uh, mesiobacca root. And look what happened. They left a spur. Okay? So left a dentinal spur. This is called a spur. The two. Okay? And the amputation side here, you're going to have food. You're going to have biofilm, you're going to have bacteria. The patient can't clean it. Dental hygienists cannot clean it. Nobody can clean this area. So what's going to happen? We're going to have problems. Second error, the root amputation site right here, this now exposed, the pulp exposed. So what they did, Dr. Haskell at USC, he did pulp capping here. He put some calcium hydroxide and close it with amalgam and leave the pulp. All of these cases failed. All these cases failed. So root amputation of vital pulp becomes, the pulp becomes inflamed, and then the pulp becomes necrotic, and then the toxins, the toxins from necrotic pulps comes out and exit here and destroy the bone that you're trying to save. So the purpose of perio as osseo surgery is to, to, to survive the bone that's left, but then you leave another problem, the necrotic pulp gives you toxins, destroys the bone you're trying to save. Then you have a risk. When that happens, okay, the pulp is necrotic, the patient is gonna have a flare-up. 
It occurs in 24 to 48 hours. I have treated so many patients in Pasadena in California. Patients coming to me, they just had surgery two days ago. And they had to, I had to do indo on a tooth, on a flap. The flap, I, I had to do indo on teeth with sutures. I one time had a patient with periodontal, uh, you know, cover, dressing. I had to remove the dressing, I find the suture, and then I got into the molar to do the root canal. Imagine you putting rubber dam on teeth, just had a flap, buccolingual flap. From that, we learned that endo must be done first. It took years to learn that. So emergency care is very difficult when you have that situation. And then you have micro leakage, okay? This micro leakage coming this way and that way. And many times when I do endo, I did endo in some of these cases, you might give me a reminder, I did this then I put my cement, I got cement all over here. Then I had to do another flap and clean the cement here. Sometimes we have to do a second surgery to remove the cement and, 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 and polish this and do odontomy over here. That's not right. And you'll see what's my technique. And then they start doing things like this. They start removing the root and keeping the disc. They did in here, what's wrong? This dentist or person here did a root canal through the crown. And that's the first thing I don't do because you don't know what's underneath that crown. There could be crack, there could be perforation, could be loose buildup. We don't do endodontic through crowns. We saving roots, not crowns, especially when the crown is not precious. And the most precious thing is the tooth, not the crown. So this person here did the root canal on, the, on this tooth, and you see this lesion here. That's weird, that's very strange location. But anyway, he decided to do this, and he left this. So when the patient bite, you have no support, plus the food problem. Many of those teeth fractured with time. And here you see now, here you see another case. This is published by, uh, this is uh, where it's published. 2014, TMU, et cetera. First of all, you learn today that there are lesions called, we don't call them endoperior anymore. I don't, you, you understand. My philosophy is this, we have endo problem, we have a period problem, and we have endo and period problem. Endo and period, only three. I don't prescribe to this classification, primary, endo, secondary, period, okay. Too confusing, okay? Endo problem, period problem, two together problem. So when they have together problems, you don't do this. So here this tooth have this, percation and this. Decided to do root canal, which is fine. And immediately go to hemisection. That's wrong. You should wait to see the endo heals, the period remains. And then you decide, endo always heal, period doesn't. So you need to wait. The other problem they did here, they start the hemisection from the top. We never start cutting the tooth from the top, never. Because if you do, you end up with a spur. I always start from the furcation up. And as I said to you, I remove the the tooth here first, and then I do what I have to do, okay? So then we start seeing that. I ask him, why didn't you remove, why you remove the crown? Why did you leave this? Oh, the contact would keep the tooth in place. But all the clues of this tooth, God made it. God created this tooth on two roots. And when you remove one root and you still have the forces of occlusion, you're gonna have fracture. The second reason for failures of hemisection and root amputation is root fractures. Why? Because of things like this. We learned this the hard way. Plus, this is a spur, and this is food impaction, bacteria growth, 
So imagine some of these patients, they have bad odor, their mouth is horrible, okay? They can't clean there. Just sits there and ferment. Make bad odor, bad smell. Anyway, this is now part of that. This is a very old case done by a periodontist. And so they did, see, he kept this contact. They believe that this is a good way to do it. I don't think so. And, and this is now the healing. He did a good job here contouring, but still I, I have a problem with the technique itself. Okay, so I wanna share with you beautiful material from this textbook on periodontal therapy in 1999, Nevis, very important people. Uh, please see this. Two lesions, two furcation lesions, class three complete furcation invasion treated this way. Look what they did. They basically removed, this is it. That's all they did. Okay, they removed, they kept the mesial, kept the mesial and removed the distal and here. By the way, the mesial root has the bulk, has, is the most volume, more strength, more support than the distal, all right? So if you can do a good job on the mesial, that's the best route to keep. It's better than any implant, any implant. God made root, well treated endodontically, in my opinion, best than any implant. And you'll see that. Here's another case. Read this, please. It says here that this radiograph taken 23 years later by Dr. Nathan. This is a long span bridge for the average size of clinical root, but it was decided the choice before osteointegration. You see, for 20 years, we did root amputation and hemisection. And I'm gonna tell you what periodontists did today. So what's the conclusion of the literature? Again, this is the studies done on the subject. Retrospective analysis, okay. You can see now, root fracture is the first cause of failure. And different authors, okay, I'm just, I'm not, I don't wanna go there. I just want the, the meat, the bottom line, the bottom line, the core. The periodontal reasons three. So hemisection root amputation is efficient technique in perio to treat frication problems. What they do today, they don't do that anymore. We do hemisection, and the dentists do hemisection and root amputation because we have success. They do something else, implants. Endodontic reasons, okay? Endodontic reasons, number three, and then caries, number four. So these are the reasons for failure of the HNA. So my residents and I, we did a lot of cases at USC, HNA, many, many, many cases. And I'm promoting that concept. I'm teaching that today as a technique for the management of endodontic treatment failures, okay? Endodontic treatment failures, surgical endodontics. And this is part of the scope of surgical endodontics. I believe, okay, that the information that we have in the literature about HNA is not correct, is not true for endo, because it's for perio patients at that time. Patients have periodontal disease, generalized periodontal chronic periodontitis. In endo, we don't have, we have healthy bone. We have healthy bone with root perforation. We have healthy bone with root fracture, one root. We have healthy bone with broken instrument. We have a healthy bone with caries in one root, but the other root is okay. That's what we have. So why should you sacrifice the whole tooth? That's why. So the literature relate to cases generalized period. And that chart I showed you, the prognosis, five to 10 years survival based on the periodontal patients. So even if you have a patient with period problem, 
you have a good five to 10 years survival span. And something else, the information we have about hemisection with amputation, many of it was endo was done afterwards. Some cases never had endodontic treatment. Okay? Some cases never had endodontic because the patient didn't have pain or patient had calcification or patient was lucky or whatever. Okay? So only the patient with pain and swelling, they go back and they get root canal after root amputation by periodontist. Periodontists did not believe in endodontic routinely. If they did, they would send the patient first to the endodontist to do the root canal, then they do the amputation. That's basic biology. That's basic biology. So unfortunately, I believe so strongly about what I'm telling you now. Since the 1990s, periodontists no longer doing root amputation and hemisection. They laugh at it. One generation, root treatment, they used to do a lot of root treatment techniques. They don't. They do only the most thing they important do. They have abandoned, abandoned HNA as a conventional periodontal tooth saving procedure. They have opted to extract the tooth, expose the patient to risky sinus lift, expensive time consuming bone augmentation, and then put a prosthetic implant instead of God made nature supported tooth structure. That's wrong. HNA is part of the periodontal specialty, which is no longer being practiced as a far as I know. That's wrong. So the procedure now is different. I believe in the 1900s, my friends, there was a focal infection era. In the focal infection era, 1910, all the way to the 50s, that's when it almost ended. Okay, the dental profession failed people, failed people. The focal infection era, dentists extracted teeth and put dentures. I hope, I pray, I pray to God that periodontists not to extract teeth and put implants. That's not. Not, not good. So basically, we need to slow down. And the important person to know that is you, the general practitioner, you, the dental students, you, the specialist in every field that should know what's right, what's wrong. It is wrong to extract the tooth if there is a treatment option. And endodontics, has many of these options. The GP should know that, that endodontic is a preventive discipline. We are a preventive discipline. We have many ways to save teeth and here they are. Okay, so what are the criteria and evidence-based consensus? Here are the criteria for selecting a case for HNA, all right? Uh, case selection factors, caries factors, root fracture factors. Here's our criteria. HNA preventive biology, its value of OAF, oral enteral fistula, very important. This is a case I did. This tooth here, I did not want to extract. This is failure, big lesion, it was in the sinus. If I remove the tooth, I will make oral enteral fistula into the sinus, sinus, mouth. And that's a very difficult thing to do when you have a communication between the mouth and the sinus. So what do I do? I do root amputation, one root at a time. First the mesiobacal, then this heals. The body heals with small opening. Sometimes you don't, but if you make this big opening, you'll see what I'm talking about in a few minutes. Uh, 
Vital root amputation is something totally risky. We do not do that, okay? Because as I mentioned, the toxicity from it. So when we come now to restorative factor, we must remove the root structure above the root. And then you customize the coronal restoration according to the what's left. Here I remove the distobacal root. You'll see this in a few minutes. This is mesiobacal, this is baratoc. This is now contoured according to the two structure remaining after the amputation of the distal root, distobacal. Second factor, the patient will have no excursive occlusal contact. You want them only in light centric. They bite only light centric. They go into med movement lateral, no. Now the dental caries factors, the, the best way to do it is to, you know, you remove the por this portion. So when you remove this portion, this area becomes, you know, becomes self-cleansing area. Now, if this tooth is virgin, you could put an implant next to this. If not, all right, you just tell me what you need, but this is the stage we do. Difficult to treat, even you or the dental hygienist. All right, we already covered this. This is again, unacceptable. These are actually cases you see being published and internet promoting these. You know, you'll see many things I do not support. And unfortunately, a lot of people did not go through the, 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 the whole picture. There's a complete picture there. Now you take this case. Very interesting case to us today. This lesion here, is this endolesion? Is it periolesion or endo and periolesion? How do you know? I will treat it. I will treat the whole thing. And this guy here, this according to this doctor here, he basically decided to do the root canal through the crown again, okay? and immediately do the amputation. You have junk over here. You don't know what's here. And one of the basic principles we do is we examine this too, there's no cracks in the remaining root, all right? So if you have a combination lesion, you don't do amputation immediately. You just wait. The endodontic factors. Endodontic must be completed before the HNA. If there is a bad endo, you need to retreat it before the HNA. And wherever you have a perforation, okay, this area must be plugged, must be filled with amalgam. And I insist amalgam. Why? Because this area is subgingival. Sometimes it's subcrestal, subosseous. And you don't want there Ferrapercha or cement or composite or glass arm or cement. You want something that really seals. And like this case here, we treated the two canals. This is perf this root here, you see the mesiobacal was perforated right in the furca, right here. Okay, that's what we call the anti curvature filing. That's another subject altogether. And then we filled it. This is a buildup with amalgam, and then you amputate. See now this area. It's subgingival, this is subosseous, this is bone here. But here you have a beautiful, beautiful amalgam seal. We do it in retrofills. So that is a must that the buildup, at least at the amputation side, to be alloy, to be amalgam. Now, if you can do it, this is another case. Look what how I handle this one here. We did the same thing, but you have a long trunk. You see this trunk? It's very long. Okay, I'm not gonna extract the tooth. It's in the sinus, look at that. So I did this. I did deep epical. Look how I beveled. I beveled it, not this way, I leveled it bacalingua. You see, and this is amalgam. It's exactly like a retro. I call these deep epical. All right, excellent. So here it is. So I go in after I finished, I go in and I cut this way. And you see, I have a lot of bones supporting the furca and everybody else. All right. Now, the factor, odontoplasty, you don't want to leave this. Okay. 
You don't want to do that. And then you must do always crown lengthening. So you can't just remove bone here and you still have it. You have to do a complete crown lengthening, complete osseous contouring, and you need to keep the biological width. So you need to do that two millimeters biological width underneath the crown margins. Okay, now let's look at the endo lesions. The endo lesion is different. In endo, the toxins go and make an epical lesion. You can see it here, all right? So this is epical periodontitis decided to make a lesion at the root end. Or, second option, the toxins come and they exit through a lateral canal and give you pararadicular lesion. This is a pararadicular lesion. That's a second option. This is not periodontal. It's still endo. Or, the toxins come in, come in, come in, come in, and they go back through the predontal ligament space, predontal ligament space, and exit through the sulcus, through the sulcus, the toxins. Okay, this is what I call the IPPP, isolated periodontal pocket, IPP. This is endodontic problem. And what's unique about this IPP is it's only in one corner of the mouth, the line angle, buckle only, mid buckle. So when you do probing, and I hope you do to all your patients, okay, you believe it or not, I worked in a clinic in Riyadh, they didn't have periodontal probes. I asked for a probe, they said, we don't have it, we have explorers, okay? so. Perio is the most important thing is to do the probing because it tells you a lot. In this case, you're gonna read three, nine, three, 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 or two, 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 12. This is it. So the destruction localized in one area is an endo problem. And it manifests as a perio. You're gonna see more cases today. And the last one into the fur cap. Comes right there in the fur cap. And now you have a, a real furcation problem. We're gonna call it endodonic furcation problem. We're gonna call it endo furcation lesion. All right, so here you have a furcation invasion, okay, from or from root resorption. Root resorption right here, and this is external. This is internal root resorption, attack the furca. This is external root resorption, attack the furcation. Here, our friends did this. These are endodontic furcal, furcal perforations. This is the accessory canals. According to all of these authors throughout the ages, there's, look at this, there is 63% canals, microscopic canals from here to the furcation. And you get lesions like this. Of course, post, post, you can see here, crack and create lesions. Perforations here and create a lesion. Okay, overzealous cleaning, overzealous enlargement of the canals create perforations and lesions. Here, perforation, lesion, one, and then these are called the danger zone. You have my article back on the anti-curvature filing. This area we call a danger zone. This is safety zone. This is danger zone. This is safety zone. This is danger zone. This is safety. So when we do root canal, we always file against the mesial, especially with rotary instrument or reciprocal movement. So all the pressure against the mesial. Look at this. This is now the distal is okay. This is protected. But here, the dentist lost the length and stripped and perforated. This is it. And here the same way. So thank you for being with us today. And I'm going to go to the next one now. 
So let me show you now some of the best practices. I'm going to go through those to show you some of the cases. You know, there's always worst practice and best practice. And I'm going to show you some, some of these slides repeated. I showed them to you from criteria standpoint, but now I'm going to show you some treatments. Okay. So this patient here, let me give you a concept now. We talk about endo problem, perio problem, endo and perio, not endo dash, endo and perio. That's very important. This is one of them. The patient had periodontal surgery. This is one of my cases. Look at this. She did great. They did good osseous surgery. And after the osseous surgery, the patient developed a lesion. Right here, you see that. Send it to me. I did the root canal. I have a look at the root resorption here. I got an overfill. And I told them, do not put a crown. Do not crown. I just put, you know, composite as a friend and we wait. Unfortunately, the dentist, she went back to, unfortunately, they did the crown. Crown. And then they had the furca exposed. They put amalgam in the furca. Okay. This is unbelievable that the patient was in her late 60s, 70s and uh, came back to me because I always recalled my patients. So we sent her for recall to see what happened to the endodontic treatment. She came back and she showed me this. Beautiful case. Look at the endo problem has healed. Look at the lesion here is gone. The overfill AH26, one of the best cements, all right? This is literally, and now you have a button. And see, this is healing. The period problem got worse because of this. So my theory here, you can't tell. So this is the concept that I taught my residents. Percentage. What is the percentage of period? What is the percentage of endo? If the percentage of perio is more than endo, you're going to have poor prognosis, like here. But it's otherwise, like here. This is now the case I did again. I did the root canal. And I waited. And I saw tremendous healing. But this didn't go. See? This healed. Look at this. Totally. This is endo. This is perio. How you treat the endo with root canal. How you treat the perio with root amputation. So I did that. We amputated the root and we put crown on. And look at this. Look at this tremendous regeneration. Why extract this tooth? Why? We could just remove the problem. That's what we did before the root canal. When you, root canal make abscesses, right? You create lesion. You don't have to remove the tooth to get rid of the abscess or the lesion. You get rid of the pulp. Okay, same concept. So then the dentist did a very nice crown here and restored the case. This is another case. This is a very obvious fracture. Patient came to us with this kind of lesion. Is this period or endo? It's irrelevant. You treat. You treat. And you observe what's the response of the body to your work. So the, the probe went almost 12 millimeters, right to the apex almost. We started the root canal. Here it is. This is, believe it or not, in two weeks, we got from here to there. This is a sign, very important sign that even opening the tooth, I didn't even finish the root canal, just opening the tooth, removing the toxins of the pulp necrosis, okay, help the case. And the body decided to heal this. This was a pocket. The root canal complete. This is called biologic root canal. I, I do, I don't over enlarge cases. I am not very aggressive in my cases. 
because especially this case had a crack, all right? And you can see now the period probe, and this is the period probe only about two weeks. That's incredible. So in this case, the endodontic percentage was greater than the period and the good prognosis. And that's what those cases I showed you earlier from different people, they don't, they don't wait, you just wait. And you do that part of the case presentation to the patient, the finalization steps. You explain every step and then you do it. Okay, here's another case we did. Uh, this is a bridge, long bridge span. This is, sub, we have a frication problem here. You see the probe going all the way to the apex and beyond. We went through the, the bridge, removed the silver points. We did gutta percha. Here was gutta percha already. And look at this, we have healing. Okay. Basic concept. Another case. Another case. This is the IPP right in the furca. Here's the lesion. Here's the endodonics. Here's the healing. Here's the restoration. Clear. And that's also what I do in cracked teeth. You know, every time I have a crack, okay, I call them crack, I have a classification, crack line, fissures, and fractures. When I have a crack, I do the endo. And then if it heals, the crack has nothing to do with it. It's the endo problem. So you can see now here, all right, how things healed. Another case. Frication endo, endofrication, root canal, healing. This is the case I told you about. This is the case I showed you a minute ago, through and through. This is, through. look at the teeth are perfect. You know, just period problem, they have it treated. But unfortunately, the, the dentist here did, did not do a good job. He basically, unfortunately, nullify the work of the periodontist and my work. All right. Another important point about hemisection and root amputation is many times you have these third molar impaction. The third molars, you know, I have a big presentation about resorption. That's one of the important areas uh, I put together on resorption. We, we have it online, some teaching courses. So you have this root resorption affect the tooth, okay? So basically you do root canal the mesial and do hemisection here. That protect the tooth from extruding on top and keep the, keep the occlusion. Another amputation of the mesial buccal root. I consider these are best practices. Look what we did to the molar. This was the first molar. We removed the mesial buccal root. This is the palatal is contoured, it's called odontoplasty. The distobuccal, the palatal, the mesiobuccal is gone, was here. And then, and here's the bridge, finished, saved it. Especially, I mean, when you look at this, this tooth has a crown. Here, you have uh, root canal from before, all right? And you had a crown. So it's better to do a bridge. Fixed partial denture is still a good option if the teeth next door are restored, especially endodontic or crowns. Not every patient has to have implant dentistry. So we talked about the oral enteral sinus. Okay, a best practice to prevent that. And you see here they extracted the molar, unfortunately. Okay, and, and this is now the sinus connection. Every time the patient, communication between the mouth and this, it's very difficult to retreat. To treat this, it takes a long time to manage the oral enteral sinus, uh, fistula. Okay, another case, the distal root, root canal treatment, and this is an old case, a, a, a mini bridge, a small bridge, just basically saved the space. This is another one, remove the crown, and this is what we found. There was a little crack right in the middle. So. This patient was treated periodontally, but this problem here was not period in the frication, was because of the crack here. So we basically did, we call this procedure bicuspidization. We kept both roots. So right in the middle, 
we incite them like that, okay? And, and many times you put here, you know, separate the root separation, and then you do the dentist, not me, did the crowns, and here's the case, restored two, two crowns on that hemisphere. So it's a very good option to save teeth. This is an interesting case, one of undergraduate students did this, did the perforation here. You can't tell the patient, the, bridge, the patient was gonna get a bridge anyway. Unfortunately, they stripped here. We never do post in mesials. We do it only in distals. And the result, basically perforation, we did amputation, and then here's the bridge, all right? Uh, recently, this is a case I did here. This patient had impacted third molar, horizontal impaction, food accumulating here. And essentially, uh, I, I told the patient, what well, best thing to do is try to save the mesial root. The distal root already sub is gone. So this is the case. You see here, the food impaction created caries in this tooth. Patient didn't even know that this is happening. So remove the restoration. And I hemisection at the expense of the root here. You see, I, I made my incision here, and then I removed the root, and then went back. Now, the oral surgeon does not have to worry about this tooth anymore because I was worried if they lean against one, we lose two molars, all right? He did it. And here's another case. Root amputation of the mesial, the vertication problem. Old case. I want you to see this patient here develop pathology, crown prep, imperial, they need to uh, became an epico. Watch this now. This is the lesion. See, period disease. Look at the period problem here. This patient, by the way, had periodontal surgery, okay? And he was maintained very well by a very competent uh, surgeon, or I mean, uh, periodontist. So I developed this. I got the patient back. I did this, retrofill. Look at the healing. Beautiful healing, okay? Now, the theory we have here that this infection, endo-infection, affect the periodontal healing. There's absolutely studies on that, okay? When you have an endodontic problem and periodontic problem, the endodontic prevent, problem delay the healing or prevent the healing of the perio. So you need to treat them both, okay? And you can see now here, everything surviving, all right? Here we're creating a little, you see a problem here, all right? Here's the case I showed you earlier with the internal resorption, exploratory for our system. I go in, I see a pulp cap. Immediately under the pulp cap, you have bleeding Exploratory surgery. Root canal, the distal is there. We did root canal, hemisection of the mesial, the buildup, the little bridge, finished. Upper, this is the root canal. By the way, we always do root canal treatment on all the roots. See, the root canal here, I don't care, it's overfilled all the roots, because you need to prevent the infection of the periodontal problem. So everything is disinfected and finished. And then we do the, we can, and this is the crown I showed you earlier. Another case, posterior, full posterior flap reflected, and you see the crack right there. This is the distal buccal root. This is the root right here, fractured, crack. The crack just a mid root down. This is the crack right there. And amputated, 
Here you see 702. I'm gonna remove, first I remove the crown portion, you see? First I remove this, and then I get to the root, not the other way around. Remove all that. Now it's easier to see the crown is got, uh, portion is removed, and then we amputate this out. This is the distal buccal root. We also were there. We just cleaned it and put retro in it. Use your buccal gun. We contoured the bone. This is all contoured, all smoothed, all polished, ready for. Uh, I gave the dentist crown lengthening sufficient for this area for his to restore. This is a case we did here at Paddy, Dr. Nasser, with me. We did it. We did this case crown. We have. Plenty of bone, most of the defect on the mesial. Reflect the flap, we see a crack. Okay, this is all emergency. First, it was exploratory surgery. We didn't know what we we're going to find. Okay, then we find this. Right now, if I know there is, first I remove the crown and then do all the work. But these are emergency cases that we had to do it to spare the patient a second one. But this is an interim endo, which I will discuss in a few minutes. I mean, coming up into a few minutes. So essentially here, we took 700 one. We start always at the furca. And we always drill at the expense of the root to be removed. So the pressure is against this root here, all right? Don't touch the back. Don't remove the root. Stay right here, all right? Now, you have to understand that. The buccal furcation, you are here, the bone here, but the lingual is higher. In other words, they don't open at the same level. The buccal furca is at this level. In the lingual, the furcation is higher. Okay, so that means you have to do a double flap, a buccal flap and a lingual flap, especially in, in the lower, you know. So you could see, because you're going to have to do crown lengthening, I was just contouring on, in all directions. All right? So now we're ready to remove the root. Now, one thing I want you to see how the, the, the crack destroyed the bone. These are easy cases. You know, my course is called Simplified Surgical Endo. We don't want to complicate things. We want to simplify so people can do them. And when they do them, they benefit people. So you can see cases like that, easy, right? Now we essentially, now we cut, and you see now we're gonna contour this, we'll be in a situation, a lot of contouring here to make this self-cleansing for, for a short period, this is not forever. This is only for a few months because I'm gonna do an implant on the distal here. This is a goner. I don't do this technique. All right. So the bone destroyed on the buckle. So now I could go to the lingual and I put my elevator and push the root to the buckle. It comes out. So I always expose the buckle cortical if there's bone. Cover. If no bone, it's, it, you'll see this now in a minute. You see now we look at the granulation tissue. Granulation tissue all over the place. This is contoured now. You're going to have some metal shaving here. This is why I don't like to do these things with the crown. I always remove the crown and do the surgery. But this is emergency amputation. It was diagnostic surgery. All right, here we go. It, here it is now. You can see smooth. You see the bone is, this is the furcal separation zone. The root is gone. You see here gold metal PFM, all come to, and here is the socket, look at that. You see now, this is the buccal bone is, I didn't remove this bone, the, the problem, the tooth crack, the lesion, okay, did that. And you see the distal root, good bone. We still have furcal bone here, all right? So this is interim surgical endo root amputation. So you're getting ideas that Surgical interim endo, this is it. Can be hemisection, can could be epical, can be so many things. We'll be talking about it the next hour. Here it is. 
this is the metal shaving from from doing this. You don't want this really, okay? Better not. But here it is removed, and this is the distal root. Now this is going to be there only for a few months, which we did. Always obtain a radio, yeah, always obtain a radiograph before suturing. Always, always. And then Dr. Nasser with uh, our faculty at Paddy, the period faculty, they, in, I think this is 2008, I think this case, yeah, here it is, 2008, uh, removed. And we put the implant right in the distal side of the socket. This is some bone osseous, uh, filling the space because it wasn't healed totally. And then the doctor went ahead and did the restoration. And here it is completed. Nice job. We, you know, our residents got a lot of training in surgery also at Paddy. Since that time, we've done some cases at Paddy. I done it also on my patients' private practice. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's, it's, you know, when you see that case, I showed you earlier today that Bassem, Dr. Gisari sent me, you say, you feel sad, you know, because you could do what I'm gonna show you now. I'm gonna show you now. The issue is what is a hopeless tooth? You know, they, oh, it's hopeless. When you say it's hopeless, don't mean extract it. See what you could do with it, okay? And it's a very important point. You know, Salama use hopeless teeth to do extrusion to prepare the site for implant from Atlanta, Dr. Salama. So they use ortho to prepare the site for the implant. I use endo, surgical and non-surgical, but mainly surgical, to prepare the site for the implant surgeon or for the general practitioner doing the implant. It's a concept here. So what is a hopeless tooth? In my opinion, a hopeless tooth can be structurally hopeless, cracks, fractures, caries, restoratively hopeless, unrestorable, endodontically hopeless, fractures, perforations you cannot repair, broken instruments. You, you know the mistakes we do in difficult endos. Periodontally hopeless, by definition, if the tooth lost 50% or more, up to 70 of the bone, it's considered hopeless. They used to do surgery on them and do root, you know, conditioning and GTR, GBR, guided, you know, soft tissue regeneration. All right, that's what they did. But this is the tooth. But what about the socket? The socket is never hopeless. That's my philosophy. You basically have intact socket or you have in defected socket, disease socket. And you have basically epical periodontitis or you have periradicular lesions, the IBP. And it could be 15 to 10 millimeters streetable and reversible. That's it. So there's no hopeless socket. There could be hopeless tooth or hopeless half tooth. All right. So how, read this, this is so important. I hate to read slides, but this man said something so important. Hopeless teeth are teeth can be treated with reasonable expectation of eliminating or even controlling their problem. See, we wanna control. And that such teeth are not always extracted, but in some situations, may be maintained occasionally, even for years. Abura says one year. Take this hopeless tooth, treat it and save it for one year. And that's what I'm gonna do the next hour. And that is my advice to you, general practitioner, because you're the one who run the show. You're the one who sent to the specialist. There are things you could do or things you expect your specialist to do. 
you can send this to a surgeon and say, do interim endo, because those things already have a root canal. That's if you don't want to do your own surgery. So it's called surgical interim endodontics. My definition, which I published in the Journal of Implant Dentistry uh, back in 2010, I said, a tooth with anatomic, pathologic, or structural problem, disease, anomaly, curved root, can't treat, 100%, pathology, AP, crack, in its crown, root, or in the bone, lesion that compromises the long term. So I use this from Dr. Hall, survival. Yeah, I could save it for a short term, but for a long term, I can't save it. So let me show you these cases. You're going to see how we did them at Paddy. Some I did in my office in, San, in California. Some we did right here. Uh, this case is Amri, Abdullah Amri case at Paddy. I did this when he was my student there. This is a beautiful case. From, this is with Dr. Becker. Dr. Becker also at Paddy. This is with Dr. Psaeus, also at Paddy. All right? So let's go. So what's the technique? The technique, basically, you already have a root canal. Here you have the guy perforated mid-root. OK? So I go in, lay a flap. Full flap, full mucoperiosteal flap, always. No semilunar, no scallop, no nothing. You know, there's periodontal disease everywhere. Look at this, perio, always perio everywhere. You don't do scallops and semilunars and all these sophisticated geometrical shapes on teeth with periodontal disease. Okay, so we essentially go in. This is perforation. This is a crack. Look at this crack. The good news, doctors, GER, United States Army colonel who did a lot of this, he took 100 molars endodontically treated and had root fractures. Okay. And they followed the study. And you know what they found? They found that all cracks, all fractures start at the apex. So they start at the apex and they move up to the CAJ. They found that many of these cracks and fractures, they stop right at the CAJ. What does that mean? It means we in endodontics doing something wrong. Rotary, reciprocal, mechanical, going right to the apex, enlarging canals, enlarging cervical zones, doing all of that. Vertical condensation, big posts, screw posts, all of these things did damage. And who paid the price? The patient. The result was extraction. So this is crap. This one, unfortunately, went all the way through. So the concept, basically, I could cut this here. I could cut this here and close. When after I close, all the bone here, because this is the nidus, this is the cause of the problem. As long as you have this bacteria are hiding here and you have micro leakage in, epical micro leakage in and out, in and out, in and out from the body and from the apical lesion. But once you remove the cause right here, why should I remove this? I wait, all right? Critical size defect. Uh, basically, in cases in the donors, periodontists, or a surgeons, okay, before they do the extraction, they should consider interim, especially in the aesthetic zone. To avoid this, we don't want this. Doctors, the thickness of bone in the cortical zone is one and a half to two millimeters. And when you want to extract the tooth endodontically treated, it's not going to be easy, especially if the crown is gone or you have a fracture. 
This is a case sent to me by my friend, Dr. Bahad, Adet Bahad. And you end up with this. This is why I'm doing interim endo, to prevent this. This is the aesthetic zone. This zone here, you have the nose, you have the canals, you have nerves, you have vessels, you have very sick bone damage. You know, a lot of good indoor around, but these teeth here, they look at those and they extract them. These two teeth here, look at that. So see the thin bone. All of a sudden, the small defect becomes huge. And now you have defect. Oh, let's do now all kinds of augmentation material. This is the sinus area, a lesion, the sinus up here. This is a critical size defect. This is now, again, published decision-making in closure oral enteral communication, all right? 2019, this is recent. So this doctor decided to extract the molar. Look at this. He extracted the molar, and you see the pathology attached to the root. This all was in the sinus. So here's the socket and here's the sinus. We want to prevent that. And then, of course, the case I started with today. Now I give it to you in detail. This is a 19 years old female. She had two to three years of ortho. Look at the ortho, uh, orthodontic resorption. But you see the tooth number nine, you know, this did not have resorption. That means this tooth perhaps was necrotic before the ortho, perhaps. See, it did not have resorption. It had the lesion. So you have no resorption, and then you have epical periodontitis. This is, I call AP, epical periodontitis. So that is in the dentist. I, I have not too much detail except what Dr. Bassam sent me. Uh, the case here the root canal, and then the patient developed a fistula. Okay, went back to their dentist. The dentist thought maybe it was coming. They did the root canal on the, the lateral and the canine. Okay, I don't know why, but that's what happened to this young, poor patient, all right? And that's the case. And then, as I told you earlier, the lesion kept going bigger, larger. And then this periodontist, I understand the young periodontist, decided, he said, doesn't heal anymore. That's, and they decided to extract. And they said, we're going to do bone augmentation. And apparently the patient is still this way, running around. My understanding, I asked Dr. Jazari recently, he, he, you know, this is the situation. So apparently they decided that. So the critical size defect we create or there are, are endodontically treatable. Look at this here, there, and there. These cases, by definition, 10 to 15 millimeters bigger, Okay, and they lose 50% of the cortical bone. That means you have to get in surgically and do a curatage. Or do root canal. The biggest augmentation for bone disease is root canal treatment. Not bio-oz or uh, freeze-dried bone or whatever. So we continue. These are the critical size defect I described to you. These are small lesions. This is eight millimeters to spit here with no problem. This is big defects over here. Critical size defect. And now we come to the situation when you have infected socket, you could do extraction and late implant placement. You do flapless, which I don't recommend. You could do GPR and late implant placement. You could do GPR and immediate implant placement. This is what's available in the field of implant dentistry. 
So when you do that, these are surgical procedures. So my contribution is surgical interim endo. And this is what the technique I'm describing. So what is it? A surgical endo protocol to cure infected, hopeless, endodontically treated teeth with big lesions and regenerate quality, regenerate quality and quantity of patient's native bone, patient's own bone for facile and safe replacement of the hopeless tooth with implant supported restoration. So we're doing implant site preparation endodontically. We're not extracting and doing augmentation. No, we're using the patient's own potentials for repair. And all requires, this is the advantage. Uh, I just sent the, this to the, there was the American uh, uh, Osteointegration Academy meeting back in March, a couple of months ago. I, I sent this uh, online presentation about interim endo. They, they asked for it. So what the advantage is, it's eliminate endodontic dental value infection. Yes. Preserve the alveolar bone, hard and soft tissue, the cortical bone and the interdental papilla, and keeping everything. It regenerates native bone, dense bone. You'll see in a minute. And look at this, endodontic lesions heal 92 to 97% predictability, reduce the need for bone augmentation, avoid the traumatic extraction, you know, those defects I showed you, they were from the extraction. Yeah, they develop instruments that a traumatic extraction. But some cases, you can't, can't control that. Facilitate immediate implant placement, yes. So basically, what's my rationale? All right. My rationale is I could use that tooth as Hall said, for a short period. The good news, 75% of dental alveolar infection are endo. That's bulk. All of these pathologies you have are endo. 25% perio and trauma. So endodontic treatment is predictable. So we take a case like this. These are my cases. And I could do this. This is even, you know, non-surgical. And you end up with, you could take a lesion like this and you end up with this healing. And look at the dense bone. Look at the dense bone healing like this. You end up with healing, good bone. This is a beautiful case. Actually, this was to be extracted. This, I done this in LA years ago. Look at this pathology. Look at the new bone we got in a matter of a year, a year and a half. And then they decided to keep the tooth, okay, after that. And this shows you again, the crown root ratio. Look at this, not, not even one, not even one. And we have this ability. So now if we have, we have bone here, you don't use long implants. If you are in the sinus area, you don't have to worry about sinus lift. You got bone, you have separation, okay? And the regenerated bone, this is important. The regenerated bone following endo treatment is native bone, according to this. There is evidence that the implant osteointegration is native bone is histologically different from osteointegration of implant placed in osteoconductive bone. Ah, what are we saying here? The bone, which is patient made, nature made, okay, is better than the bone BioOS is making or GBR is making. That's important. Okay, so you reduce that lead. So the lack of quantity and quality of bone created this fantastic market, fantastic availability of all kinds of bone augmentation material. I use them. I, I use them in surgeries, I use them in a variety of things. It's great we have them when you need them. All right, so let's go to Dr. Psaia's case. It, the root canal treatment, excellent. What happened here, unfortunately, this is the mesial lingual 
distal buccal palatal perforation happened. No problem. It's a terminal tooth. I'm not going to extract it. Basically, we did hemisection, root amputation of the palatal root. We hemisectioned the tooth. So we laid a flap. This is distal buccal, mesial buccal. Huge defect on the palate. You don't see it because the palatal here, okay? This bone defect, huge. The doctor then made a provisional, then do build up on the two remaining roots. This is the distal buccal root. This is the mesiolingual root in mesial root, there's two canals. And did the bridge, temporary bridge. Here it is. This is now the, the two buccal roots are here, okay? The palatal is gone. The case is healing. This is Pontic, and then this is the provisional. We did this at Paddy. We did a lot of work there. Um, and then in eight months, this is before, and this is in eight months, you could see the bone coming back. Beautiful healing, beautiful healing. And then our faculty removed the two. This is distal buccal, this is mesial buccal. Put two implants. And then the case was restored with the implants. The next patient, this is my case at clinic, uh, the, the IV clinic at the hospital. This is we diagnostic surgery. We have a lesion here, lesion here. And then you have here, overextended gutta percha done by somebody, and here's a sinus. So if you extract the tooth and put this, you are in the proximity of the sinus, or you are in the sinus. So this is what we did. We went in, we removed the apical root. This is the old gutta percha, burnished it. This is less than one-to-one -one crown ratio. And this is the new bone. Okay, this is all new bone, and then our faculty placed an implant and here's the implant, and here is the tooth. The third case, this is the one in Los Angeles. I basically had the situation, is a crack here, hairline crack, crack line, crack line. Remove the crowns, okay? We basically had build up, go in, remove the amalgam, do a deep epical clean it here, another clean here, this is the gutta percha, it was done there. With her, I burnished it, did not make a new root canal, just basically removed the cause of the problem here. And now you have a critical size defect. Okay. And then you have the healing on that in six months. This is the last case we did in at Paddy. This is a patient, unfortunately, had a root canal. She, for some reason, did not follow up or she didn't have schedule, whatever. And she developed caries on these teeth. This is tooth number six. That's upper right canine. This is upper right canine. This is upper left canine. <clears throat> Take a look at this. These teeth are basically destroyed from caries. Uh, there's no tooth structure. Now imagine taking, extracting these teeth. Okay, what's going to happen to this bone? We're going to create that defect you've seen, you know, pictures. And this is my technique. Here, caries. Dr. Bucker cleaned them all, remove all the decay. We have got a pressure down there. See now, got a pressure here. You see, we got a pressure there. You basically have shell, all right? This could serve you for a few months. It cannot serve forever. And that's the whole idea here, is you get the patient psychologically prepared for the next step. And you're creating, these keys did not have, had small lesions you'll see in the bottom minute, but we did not want to create more defect. Then we did composite buildup. These are a parapost. These are titanium. Titanium is better than stainless steel. Okay, the best is fiber post, but this is it. So then we did the buildups on these. All right, see the shinjiba? 
we kept everything beautiful structure and then now let me show you this is the build up then we build a provisional for the patient and then we go in and the she waited uh, now we're going to same appointment now this is in, before we have not done the implant yet here are the teeth now with flab is done this is when you when you lay the flab look at we didn't touch this this is the way the patient is apparently uh, the the you see the, bio, the the need for the biological width all this bone is gone naturally by pathology or time all right two cast posts over here all right and these are the teeth we're gonna basically go in tooth basically and you have cast post all right now this is the surgery remove the pathology very little this means critical bone thickness very little you do epico here you do epico here here was a big lesion we remove the lesion and we remove deep epico again it was big problem you see and you have very little bone supporting all right this is in 2008 we did curettage and epigorectomy and here it is in 2009 remember this see how the nature closed everything now you have this the only one that created the problem this area right here i call sob surgical osseous band this is exposed and here we have pathology this if this bone is less than three millimeters it will resolve and that's exactly what happened. We have no more bone on this tooth. Everything is beautiful, cast, excellent, American system. All good bone, ready to go. And now we're gonna have very easy extraction, simple, because you have very short roots, been epicotomized. Here they are. This is the epico, we did deep epico. Tooth is, look how easy extraction, very fast. There's no more trauma. So you got a new bone, and even the old bone now is not traumatized by the extraction procedure. They placed the implants in 2009, and that, that this is the case with uh, which we did with Dr. Abdullah Al Amri at at, uh, at Paddy also. And here we are. They, they did all that work. The good thing we did here, we had this connected. We expected that tooth was a problem, and then. It did again again and again look what happened to the cortical bone it's all gone this is why diagnostic surgery is so important so important it gives you a lot of information before you make decisions to extract and destroy everything so here we have it's connected here we did deep we did actually lingual flap and now we're going to remove the root we're going to keep the crown because it's like a pontic around here. And we did remove it. Here it is. Take 701 and we write at the, below the surgery here, we serve CEJ and you go to the buckle and the lingual. Here is the root removed, okay? Now you wait for bone to heal and then you do what you have to do. This is the last case I'm going to show you this morning. This is a trauma case, emergency, emergency surgery. Again, uh, patient was very good. Came to me plus three mobility. This tooth was so mobile. All right. So I did in one visit, laid, filled this, removed that. And this one at that time was testing positive or questionable when I did the emergency surgery. I did a lot of emergency surgery. You know, just basically just do it. And then now the reason I show you this is the issue of crown root ratio. You know, we make so big deal about crown root ratio. I have treated, I have saved teeth less than one crown root ratio. But they're not abutment for bridges. Okay, like this one. Look at this. This is root, epical root is removed, and you see the regeneration. All right. This is, that's all we have, boom, right there. So it's possible to do that. Uh, I think we all need a break.
basically, I, I told you the course is to have material that help you in endodontic treatment failures or mistakes or complications. Now, the procedures which we did a lot at USC and here is called intentional replantation. Again, endodontic intentional replantation. This is, I really believe in this procedure, okay? Um, general practitioner should definitely know this procedure because it's a interim again, it's an interim procedure, but not endodontic, it, it's interim dental. This is a patient, this actually a dentist uh, at USC was one of our dental fourth year, third year dental student had this crown and apparently they had a perforation here, an old root canal and things failed and you could see the lesion we have here, okay? So I'm gonna go through the detail on this. It's a 100% clinical issue. Okay, so essentially you just, as a, you know, you anesthetize, you do the whole thing, you extract the tooth. Try your best to extract the tooth and do not, try your best, do not put, here I'm just holding with the forceps, okay? Try not to traumatize the cervical zone where the attachment apparatus is because that's, the damage there, but create more resorption. So we extract the tooth as, as, as intact as possible. I mean, the extraction as atraumatic as possible. You don't want to lose the, root, the roots. Uh, you don't want to fracture. Now, here is a wet gauze. This is saline. You take a wet gauze, okay? And you have basically eight to 10 minutes. In eight minutes, eight to 10 minutes, you have to do the endo, if you have to do endo, or you have to do the uh, repair of a perforation and put the tooth back. Cases which we did, we did actually monitoring these cases. Eight to 10 minutes, I had them survive for five, six, seven years, all right? It's absolutely wonderful procedure for hopeless teeth again. So we have, here is a different option. <clears throat> I have many cases. I selected a couple that actually I could explain the procedures. So we have a wet gauze. This is the perforation site. You see now, this is my hand. I'm holding this, gloves and gauze wet. And you have a, basically the dental assistant ready, your setup ready, everything you may need is ready. Because you're going to be doing a root canal if you need it. You're going to be doing a retrofill if it's needed and you're gonna put the tooth back. So here we have a perforation, we go back in. This is what I said, you need to be ready because you need, have only eight to 10 minutes to make a better prognosis, all right? All right. <clears throat> we, cl we clean the area, remove the granulation tissue. Here was the granulation tissue all over. You remove that, with the scalars, and then you go to the perforation site. Again, you see tissue we're growing in. We clean it, remove some of the garbage, disinfect this with sodium hypochlorite right there. I don't put sodium hypochlorite everywhere. Right there, I disinfect that. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is a great disinfectant. It works in about maybe 40, 50 seconds, all right? 5%, I disinfect the area. And then we remove, you see, it's really bad percussion perforation, all right? This is the granulation tissue, all right? Remove the gutta and now you have a kind of retentive place. Then I go to the apex. I do the epicoectomy. I actually do an epico, remove about two millimeters from the root ends. Because when I put this tooth back, I want it to be lower than occlusion. I want it to be sub occlusion. Okay? So we take a 702 Fisher Burr and I do epico in hand with water spray, keep water spray going on. In this case, I'm using a round burr. You could be used ultrasonic, whatever you do. You do pothole cavity. You just go into the, to the area, get to the gutta percha. You prepare this, prepare that. And now, still wet gauze, still ready. Now we get amalgam. 
I use amalgam. You, you, that, that's what you want, okay? You want a good sealing material because this amalgam now, I'm gonna actually burnish it, polish it. When you burnish the amalgam, it sets fast. And this is zinc-free amalgam, all right? It, when you burnish it, you polish it with the burnisher, it sets fast. And then I, so I did the epico, I did this here, there. And then I went back to the perforation side and I put amalgam there. This is putting amalgam there. And then I go back to the socket. Now is a critical stage. The first thing we do back, you basically do not, you wanna remove the granulation tissue. So you take Mar C3, that's the curet, uh, the curet we talked about, that's we, all right? And we remove the granulation tissue if it's available. Sometimes most of the granulation tissue come out with the extraction, but sometimes you still have some there. Be sure you go to the epical portion, okay? Try not to touch the walls of the socket. And you have any tissue on the tooth in question, don't touch it. So basically when you're handling the tooth, you're not removing any of the periodontal ligament attached to the socket or to the tooth. You go back now to the socket and you evacuate the blood. Remove all the blood with, you know, that took place in it. You wanna remove the blood clot because that blood clot which formed in the socket will break down later on. You want a fresh red clot after you put the tooth in. Repeat, you evacuate the blood clot, you evaluate what's in the socket, and now you go back and you put the tooth back in place and push it down epically. Remember, we removed two millimeters from the root length, all right? So you go immediately below the subocclusion. Now, <clears throat> many cases, like in this case, when I, we did not have to do any splinting of the tooth next door. You're gonna see cases which we did. It was so retentive in place, have the patient bite, you do not want them to touch the tooth. Keep it down. It will come back to occlusion as it heals. All right? So, put it back. And here it is. This is now, you know, I said the doctor and the patient was a dental student. And that's what basically we have here. And here's the, the amalgam. This is immediately after I put it back. See the, the lesion was all over this place. Okay, this is the percation repair. This is the retrofills after I put it back. And here is the recall on it. See the healing we have? Healing all over the place. Now, what's the prognosis? On these cases, eventually you will have resorption. Where? You will have periodontal resorption. Exactly where you have the forceps when you grab it. They start at the, at the interdental zone right here. And that's essentially, but that, occurs if you have a good root canal, okay, you do not have harbor for bacteria to go. The prognosis is excellent. Okay, five, six, 10 years, I had patients, you know, reported to me, other doctor, they had them for much longer than that. The key is you have good endo on the tooth or retro. This is another case. Now this case, um, I would say, this really is part of the interim idea, but now this is a replantation. This patient was 70 years old and she had post, old silver point, huge lesion. See the lesion right there, huge. came to me, what can you do? She has pain. I knew this tooth is hopeless. There's nothing I could do for this patient because if I remove the, the post, okay, then I have the silver point. 
Now you can see now what's, what happens when I judge it radiographically, it was one diagnosis, but when I started doing the case, I found other things. So this patient, I examined the patient. My options are basically extraction, no, yeah, extraction. She said, is there any way you could save the tooth, please? I said, let me take a look. So I look and this patient and the mandible, she had this situation. She had the bicuspid in a, look at this back up. This is in a buccal location. This is the first premolar. This is second premolar. And this is looking at lingually. I said to her, I could do for you transplantation, which means I could actually, if we lose that tooth up there, okay, uh, the area is so infected and implant is not in the picture for her, I said, I could maybe transplant this tooth for you. She said, okay, all right. So this is what we did. The first thing I did, remove the crown, remove the post, remove the silver point, and this is what I got. This is what we have, the bicuspid, all right? Took a burr, and I went right through the apex, right there. Not with a burr, it could be big files, okay? And go right through the apex and drain. Essentially, I drained. I get the creatage of the epical pus and all of that through the canal. There's no way you could do surgery on this case, okay? Because tooth was fractured, I mean, the post and all of that. So we did the root, and then disinfected it with sodium hypochlorite, real good disinfection, and temporized it with cavit. This is now one week after I repeat that two, three times. So I see for two weeks, just basically three weeks. So how do I know tooth is ready for my action? Basically drainage in the canal. The canal now become, first it was pus, it was debris, uh, it was exudation. As you are, and again, believe me, I did not use any medication, no calcium hydroxide whatsoever. I never use the calcium hydroxide in my practice or I recommend it. My, the medication I use is sodium hypochlorite, disinfectant, 5%. And basically we got disinfected, we go in dry. You take paper points and you get no bleeding on them, all right? We basically, we did the trephination of the apex, you know, size 30, 40, 50, no more. No burr, just with the uh, endodontic files. Okay, now. On the determined day, the patient came back. We anesthetized the lower, extracted the bicuspid. Here it is, extracted. Here it is coming out. All right. And ready to go. When I said ready to go, meaning you're set up 100% ready. I'm going to be doing a root canal, and I'm going to be putting the tooth back in the socket. I'm going to extract the upper tooth and put this in its place. This is intentional transplantation. All right. Again, gauze, new gauze, wet, epicoectomy at the tooth. This is mechanical reciprocal. Go in and I basically do root canal reverse. I did not make access. I just go through the apex all the way up and clean it. Exactly the same procedure. Use sodium hypochlorite, remove the tissue, enlarge the canal. The actually, you could see the apex enlarged exactly. I would, instead of flaring the cervical zone, I flared the epical zone. That's done. Of course, you have to have the assistant with you. At least two assistants ready in addition to yourself. Then, the AH26 placed 
into the canal, try to go at, with files. I use curl file and pump it in. I'm trying to get all the way to the chamber if I can, all right? And then this is the uh, Aptura uh, gutta percha. Fill it, pack it, pluggers, etc. Then burnish it. Here we are burnishing the gutta percha. Here it is burnished already, okay? Now, I'm sorry, but I do have a picture like this with the, I hope I find it, with methylene blue. I put methylene blue here and you can see perfectly the outline. And then we go up to the bicuspid area, curettage the area from all the granulation tissue. The treatment which I did conservatively helped a lot, okay? You didn't get newborn immediately, but at least you had a site which is prepared. Take the bicuspid again and put it back in the upper. Eight minutes, all of this. It was easy to remove the tooth on top. You put it back in, have the patient bite, and it's sub, okay? She's not touching it, all right? And then take composite, and we attach it to the canine because it's not attached to this. This is, this is the canine, and this is the tooth I put back. Okay? Give the patient instruction to stay on soft food. She had to go home. She put ice packs, four hours, five minutes on, five minutes off, slight pain medication. If, don't expect any, any major problem. I swear to you, did not have any any pain in those cases. So, composite in, soft food, and here is the view a week later. Composite, the tooth in place, occlusion. And then we go to the bottom. This is the x-ray on the bottom, the radiograph. And, and basically you see the the healing, the tooth was here and it's all healed nicely. And this is the tooth on top. Remember there was a lesion here. This is about four weeks later after in, insert, you know, replacement. Look at the gutta percha, how far we were able to go. We cleaned it all the way to the chamber. And this is the, uh, flaring I did at the apex. I was able to get here because of this flaring, all right? And you can see now we are beginning to have good regeneration. Here's the patient now. We followed up like eight weeks, three months, four months. And, and here's the patient. Of course, there's not much I could do about this. The patient least have that as a procedure. You see now, this is day of insertion. This is weeks later and the periodontal probing. And here's the case now, radiographically. This is before, this is the day of insertion. Look at this defect here and look at the healing we have. Beautiful, very, very nice over here and then here. Okay, second case. The second case is, again, I share it with you because I think it's a story by itself. This patient having external root resorption here, this tooth technically is gone. It's gonna be gone, but we did not, you know, we don't wanna open it up because this is definitely external and the prognosis is not good here, you know, on, on, it's to the lingual, by the way, to the lingual, that's to show you how far it's gone. So this tooth became essential from cosmetic standpoint, okay, because when she smiled, patient showed this tooth. This was treated by a dentist. And uh, I don't know the reasons, but apparently the dentist perforated 
perforated during access opening. And then he went ahead and put amalgam in the perforation site. Okay. After he put the amalgam, he sent the patient to me. And he said, Marwan, please, please save the tooth. Very nice young patient, very nice young lady. And she was very cooperative. She wanted to save this tooth. This is now the era before implant became like the status that every, we're looking at this area, we're gonna lose both of them, all right? And uh, at that time we were doing a lot of replantation, you know, when it's indicated. I said to him, I could do surgery with the retrofill. When I am there, I could do uh, this, I could burnish this because there was a defect now beginning here and you could actually probe and the amalgam was right there, would be creating a periodontal defect. Many of the dentists I worked with, they just basically trust you. So they want you to do whatever you feel professionally is required or indicated. All right, let me show you what happened to this case. We did the surgery. So we did the flap, ready to do the retrofill. Actually, you see me here now, this is the tooth. I am creating an epic, I went through the bone with a Bart Parker and I actually placed a retrofill nicely at the root end. I was happy about that. And uh, the next step is to go to the, to the uh, amalgam extra fill to remove it. Now I have to be careful about that cutting the amalgam in, in bone, you're going to have the amalgam firing everywhere. So I took a scaler, Gracie scaler, to probe, to probe the overfill of the amalgam. As I'm doing that, go like this, the tooth came out. The tooth just basically came out the socket in my hand. Okay, the tooth came out and I am absolutely embarrassed now. When the tooth came out, it fell on the ground, on the floor of my clinic. And all of a sudden we are looking for it, all right? It took a few minutes, we found the tooth. We disinfected it again, washed it, I, you know, this. We told the patient immediately what's happening. I said the tooth basically, she said, I knew that was the trial and see what you could do anyway. I said, I'm gonna put it back. So we used saline, we washed it, okay. Even, even anesthesia, the area, clean it. And we put the tooth back. So when it was out in my hand, I took this here. You see me now taking a seven finishing burr and I'm removing the amalgam where the dentist perforated right there. And this is the retrofill I placed normally on that tooth. And this is the tooth that was apparently like a hook. When I touched this, apparently, you know, it was very defect uh, caused Came, that's it. We removed everything, luckily, outside the mouth. And we put it, here it is polished, the tooth is polished, and put it back in place and suture. I show you this case. I'm not going to say that to do it routinely, but to show you the potential, the potential of the eight minutes story. Okay, here's the tooth. <clears throat> this is three weeks after reinsertion. 
Of course, we put composite, we put the tooth back and we put composite. Uh, this is the resorption I told you about that other tooth. This is a big hole over here, all right? So this is the composite, we put the tooth back and look at the Ferio Pro, look at the blanching of the tissue. Okay. Continue. This is the palatal view of the area, the buckle. Here is the case now. Sequence, retro, tooth is out, finished. This is polished and put back. And that's basically the replantation that we, we discussed, all right? I'm gonna share with you, in, it's very difficult to say surgical emergency. We're gonna talk about IND and all of that, but the issue of emergency pain, all right? I'd like to share with you some information about toothache, okay? So when you talk about orofacial pain, this is a study that was reported, 2,700, et cetera, patient. And they basically did a survey about patients walking with pain. I want you to know that this is so important. 90% of the pain in dentistry is toothache, 90%. Okay, 2% is post-operative pain after restorative dentistry, after surgery, 7% mucogingiva, okay? Mucogingival pain, period. It's a salivary gland less than one, maxillary sinus less than one, TMJ less than one. This is very valuable information for general practitioners. Your business is basically related to indoor period. All right? So you must be so competent, so competent in diagnosis. And the more competent you are in diagnosis, the better dentist you are. I really believe in the concept of being a master diagnostician. Uh, you know, I, I always say a good GP knows all about endo, but they don't have to do it. But they know all about ortho. Why? What happens? All of that. But they don't have to do ortho. They know all about perio. What they have to do, things related to their profession in Indo, they could do a lot of Indo. 80% of Indo done in America is done by GP. 80%. Okay? So it's toothache. Toothache. And when we look into toothache, Look at this, from toothache, 35% is pulpitis, all right? 35% is pulpitis. And apical periodontitis is 52%. So a lot of our patients gonna have to us with pain because of pathology at the root end. Apical periodontitis, they call it periodontitis, okay? 52%, it's more than pulpitis, all right? Perio is about 3% or 4%. Pericoronitis, you know, around the third molar is about 3%. Hypersensitivity, 6%. This is a very important study. I, I followed it up. So what does this mean to me? A lot of our patients, okay, have pain, have pain with lesions, with epical periodontitis, with whatever pathology they have, only in their late stages. And that's almost 50% of 1,300 patients, all right? That's to take in considerations. These patients did not come with pain. Very little, they're gonna to come to you with pain because of pulpitis. When they come to you, they come with a big problem, abscess, and then, Idiopathic pain is 5%, TMJ is little, sinus is little. All right. Okay. 
This lead me to a very important, if you take nothing from today's course, take this in terms of emergency. <clears throat> Walden Bell was like a scholar, maxillofacial surgeon. <clears throat> of course, now there's a book called Bell, Walden Bell textbooks on pain. Uh, but he was huge in the 80s. Read this very slowly. The extreme variability of toothache is such that a good rule for any examiner, okay, is to consider all pains about the mouth and the face, mouth and face, to be of dental origin, meaning toothache until proven otherwise. So you need to be a good examiner to be able to say this lower molar pain, this ear pain, this headache, etc., cetera, et cetera, all of that, I'm not gonna go into a um, course on pain, but this is how important toothache is. And why is that? It's because if you uh, take time to look into the anatomy of the trigeminal nerve, you'll see that the ophthalmic nerve, the maxillary nerve, the mandibular nerve, they all intermingle. They all meet somewhere close to proximity to each other. The face, the head is so rich with anatomy. And I want you always to think about, we have one heart, two lungs, two kidneys, we have 32 teeth, 32 teeth. And if you lose your molars, you have 28. And those 32, each one has a pulp, have a periodontal membrane, have an attachment, and they all connect it. This is how difficult, okay? This is why you need to focus on that issue, toothache. All right, so I cannot separate pain from surgery, it's all together. Half of the differences in pain response are genetically determined. Half are determined by experimental psychological. So when his doctor saying very important studies, huge name, Flanagan, he's saying basically we are born 50% with our pain threshold. We get it from our parents and you see more. The other half of pain response, pain response means threshold. I stabbed you, you hurt. I drilled, you had pain. Pain threshold, the response to pain, to stimulus, is genetic. The other 50% is from the environment. And you'll see what I mean by that. So when I talk about pain threshold, I study this a lot and I lecture about it. And I've been throughout the world, so I see the differences. But this slide telling you that an Irish is different from a Mexican, different from Asian, different from American, different from Middle Eastern, different from Einstein, etc. Each one of those people responds to toothache is different response to injury, dental, we're talking, is different. Some people have hurt and they don't complain. Some people hurt a little bit and they make a big deal out of it. You know that. So we are very much affected either with genetics, the race, or with the environment we live in. Male, female, students versus teachers. Black versus white, white versus yellow, et cetera, Asian versus Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And studies available about the different races and the pain responses. And I, I, uh, I reviewed articles about how the Middle Eastern, we are, respond to pain. Okay? We complain. Female tolerate more than male. Imagine that. Compared to the Mexican, we have, for example, here, they suffer with silence and they consider it a family affair, okay? The Irish, 
very, very stoic about pain. They take it and they don't complain. Okay, so you need as being a dentist to understand these individual differences in responses of your patient when they have a toothache. And always be kind, always be gentle, always be human, all right? But respectful, respectful. This is when we talk about emergency care. I have a whole lecture about the human aspect of emergency pain. To me, when the patient is in pain, it's the best time to build relationships with that patient. When the patient is coming to you for help, it's the time to build rapport, to build a relationship. And we know that patients who likes their dentist, love their dentist, Whatever the dentist does, they don't complain. They praise you, whatever you've done. But if they don't like you, they don't like the way you treat them, anything you do is gonna count against you. So when you come, a patient has pulpitis, have an abscess and you relieve them from the pain, that's building relationship for a patient to accept the treatment that follow. Don't take it lightly and on the contrary, you know, make room for your schedule for those patients and give them a special attention. That's the lesson. And never treat a stranger. A good physician treats disease. The great physician treats the patient who has a disease. You know, in the United States, people say, you know, there is a patient attached to that tooth. Because we become so involved with cavity preparation, root canal preparation a placing implant, put a crown, okay? We forgot behind <laughs> the patient. That's why you make, they make extreme fun of this. Remember doctor, there is a patient attached to that tooth. So take care of the patient. That's what William Osler is saying, basically. All right, so in emergency, we're talking about these are the endodontic aspect where you have a surgical emergency. So what are the surgical emergency that I'm planning to talk about today is the incision and drainage, the surgical lancing, the trephination. Okay. And all of those, they cannot be done well, unless you open the tooth, but you could do for a while. But remember, IND is not a treatment. IND, incision and drainage, is not a treatment, okay? It's a step towards a treatment. All right, so basically we have acute epical abscess, fistula tracking, palpation test, okay? Sounding, this is sounding, sounding. Sounding is when you put your probe and look for where the bone is. Probing is when you put the period probe and look where the attachment is. Very important two difference. You cannot do sounding without anesthesia. Don't do it without anesthesia, all right? And then the isolated periodontal pocket, which we talked about. And then of course, the apical periodontitis, which is not symptomatic. Okay, so in terms of emergency uh, test, Three tests we're talking about, percussion, palpation test, and then fistula tracking. These are the percussion test is useful only when you have an acute condition, occlusal trauma, initial abscess. Percussion test is useful, very useful, when the pulp just died last night. When the patient comes to you, you take an x-ray, you see no lesion, but you will see lamina dura disruption. You do ice test may respond positive because the pulp is not totally dead. You do percussion test, the patient jumps. So it's useful with acute epical periodontitis. Acute epical periodontitis may not see on the radiograph. Okay, and then symptomatic epical periodontitis. 
uh, one thing I'm just going through here, as a rule, forgive me, I never examine the tooth in question. If the patient has pain on the right side, I examine the left side. The patient has pain in the first bicuspid on the right. Abscess, cold, whatever test you're going to do. I always tell the patient, let me check the other side first, which you have no problem, okay? And then we compare right and left. So you check the left, palpation, percussion, percussion, percussion. Come to the tooth in question. Don't touch it. Go next to it. And then the last tooth you're going to stimulate, the last tooth you're going to test is the tooth in question. Which one is the patient complain about? So when the patient comes to you and say, this one, no, don't start there. Go next to it or the other side. What you're trying to do is teach the patient how to, to feel. They feel, oh, this, oh, I felt that, I felt that, ice, yeah, yeah, I felt that, I felt that. But then you come to a necrotic tooth, they don't feel it. They look at you, wow, how come I didn't feel that? Then you tell them what. But if you go directly and hit percussion on the tooth in question, you lost, all right? So that's the always collateral. Palpation test, there's two types of emergency we're gonna talk about. Indurated, hard swelling, and soft fluctuant. The fluctuant is basically, what is the fluctuant swelling? Is pus run away from the end of the root, pus sneaked from the bone, and now it is stuck underneath the mucosa, I, I, I mean gingiva, and the periosteum, the bone. So basically, you have a, po a pocket of pus. That's where the pus is when it's fluctuant. And that will be screaming to be incised. The second one is indurated. Indurated means hard. Hard swelling is also a big problem, but we don't do IND, we do surgical lancing with a blade. Indurated swelling is basically the bone actually, the cortical bone is being pushed out. That means patient having big problem. So indurated swelling, many of times you do the surgical lancing, you do to give antibiotics, and you need to bring the patient back to start the root canal. So again, when you do palpation, always two fingers, right and left to palpate, right and left. Okay, the next test, which I really would like you to focus attention, this is in the United States, fistula tracking is a standard of care. So the minute the patient come to you with pyrolus, pyrolus, this is called pyrolus or fistula opening, the patient call a gum boil, you need to track it. How do I do that? Take a 35 got a percha point, 35 size. Be sure to flex it before you put it in. So it's not old. Sometimes if you have an old got a percha, okay, it will break inside. You don't want, and you basically feed it into the socket. Now this one here is this x-ray. So it goes in and goes right to the two in question I have here. First by, second by, it goes right to the problem. Especially when you have two teeth. Now, this one is wrong. What I do after, I show you this for teaching purposes. After I put this in, then I take scissors and cut it right here. Leave only about one, two millimeters to grab it and remove it, okay? Why? Because I wanna know the point of entry. When I cut it here, I know everything else is in tissue, in tissue, all right? Look, another one. Oh, here I have sounding. See, I'm going all the way down with the perio Pro. Okay, this is the value of fistula tracking. It's a diagnostic test, very essential. 90% of positive fistula is endo. 
10% is perio. When you have a gum problem, periodontal problem, it just goes in, it doesn't go to the apex. The beauty of it, when you have two endodontic treatment, I have one bad endo, I have two this endo. And so we do the fistula tracking, this is the point of entry right here. It goes in and goes right around this one. It didn't go to the, this one. This is the lesion it's right there. Here, I have a problem in this molar. The fistula here goes in and turn right to the tooth in question. All right, now I'm gonna ask your opinion. We're gonna ask you a question. I want you to think with me. It's five o'clock in your office. You have a private office, okay? This has actually happened to me, so I'm sharing it with you. Uh, patient come, you're ready to go home, but you have one more emergency. Patient in severe pain. Okay, bring him in. So we look at the second molar, doctors. We see basically in the frication here, 10 millimeter pocket right here. I have a lesion right here. I have a bad crown. You can see the margins, bad crown. Old root canal. Uh, oh, by the way, we have draining coming from this area, but there's a fistula right next to the furcation. This is the second molar. The first molar, we have lesion here. We have lesion here. And look at the lamina dura, it's gone. Here it is, stop. You lost all the lamina dura. Okay. All right. Some lesion here. AP on mesial, and you have bone loss right here. Bone loss, bone loss, vacation problem here. And you have a crown, good crown here. See nice margins. All right, my question to you, of course, you're not gonna answer me, but think about the answer to yourself. Question to you is, what do you do right now? It's five o'clock, you're ready to go home and you have emergency. Will you work? What, what would you do? You have a fistula tract. Fist. Okay, would you open this tooth? When I saw this patient, 100% in my mind, I said, I'm going to remove this, remove this silver point because I have pathology here and I have a problem right here. And then I look here, I see this one. So what would you do? And which tooth, if you have a choice, would you start? Second molar or first molar? That's your question. So here's what I did. I put a fistula track on the buckle and look at this. Look how beautiful the fistula tracking test is. It saved my day. We got in, all the focus was here. It came from the second molar perca, goes mesial, cross the distal root, cross the mesial root, and go in, interdental right to here. This is useful. This is useful because the minute I saw that, this, that means this pus from here took the pass of least resistant damage here and exited there. The pus did not want to break the bone here or there or even here. The bacteria decided the pus, the pressure went, this is all damaged tissue. This is sand and that's where it exited. So what we learned, the orifice of the fistula is not where the problem is. And this is why you need to track. This is why you need to track, trace. We call it fistula tracing. I opened this tooth, okay? I opened this tooth. And I got basically the answer to that. So fistula tracking is part of the procedure. You see a fistula, don't take an x-ray, get them and then take the x-ray. So this is now management of acute apical abscess. 
Of course, you take head on x-ray. This is the case treated by a dentist putting here, and then the patient had a problem. So we measure the tooth on the digital. We see how long it is. So record that. And then add to it three to five millimeters. So I measure from incisal edge to apex and add to it three millimeters. So now I have 21 plus 25. I have 25. This is where I am. This is the lesion. All right. In this case, after we anesthetize the patient, we always anesthetize, we're going to tell you in a minute, but in this case, after I anesthetized the patient, distal and around, I took a probe just to check, and this is what I got. This is the pus I told you about, trapped between the mucosa, I mean the gingiva, and the bone, All right? Okay. So how are we going to manage cases like that? So most of your lesions of endodontic origin opens where? On the buccal fistula, thank God. Repeat, most of them open like this on the buccal. You'll see some of them. When do cellulitis happen? When this root end not going to the vestibule or going to the palate is going to the muscle attachment. When the infection goes to the muscle attachment locations, muscle insertions, it creates those known facial spaces and creates cellulitis. That's when you have Ludwig and you have different kinds of facial swelling. All right. So, uh, I'm going to show you now this quickly, and then I'll show you the writing in bit. So basically, in this case, we anesthetize. We always anesthetize distal to the tooth in couple of teeth and around. We don't anesthetize around the infection itself, around the swelling up there. As I said, we measure and we go up three millimeters, and then we take a barred Parker. This is 15 percent, 15 barred Parker blade. We insert about one centimeter here one centimeter. And here I have a suction tip, high speed volume suction, ready to get the pus. See the pus here? This is all pus, immediately evacuated with the suction tip we have here. Now, this is a quick case. We suction here, then I will take Mar EX1. This is Explorer I designed, UD Fred. EX1 is the huge, strong explorer. I take that explorer and I go touching, surveying the bone. I made the opening. Now I want to know where is the hole? Where is the defect to the root end? So I basically survey the area. Push hard, push hard, push, it goes in. Then that's the area you need to enlarge with Mar EX2, which is a bone file. This is emergency surgery. You know, I did not do a flap. I can do a flap. This is emergency care. All right. So now we get this. Then you see my finger up here? <laughs> okay. My finger here is massaging, massaging this area, pushing any pus out. All right. And then I will take anesthesia and inject it right here injected right into the incision I made. When I push anesthetic, anesthetic goes in and what comes out? The pus remaining or the blood. This is my, pro my protocol. Here is now inject anesthesia into the incision site to displace remaining. See, this is the incision about one centimeter. Here we are surveying the cortex is a cortical bone. And then we enlarge it with Aboras 2 to get the exudation. Do not use any drain. Never in my life, ever, I put a drain in an incision I did. Never. Something back from the last century. We basically do all the work in the dental office, put the patient on antibiotics, and bring them back to open the tooth. Okay. If the patient can be opened, many times I do incision and drainage first, and then I open the tooth. So 
So patient, I have time to open the tooth. I do this first, get rid of all the pus, so I can put rubber dam, and then I open the tooth. So no drain. Drains attract bacteria, cause infection, delay healing, especially if sutured in place. Oh, they used to do that. Now, incision drainage after two weeks. This incision in two weeks, this is what we got. Fast. Very good. All right, here's another case. This is now, we're gonna show it from the beginning. This is topical anesthesia, topical. Now I go, this is the tooth in question. I'm gonna go right here and inject, inject always to the distal. All my injections are distal and then the vessels will bring it to the mesial. That's what I'm working. And if up, upper, this is anterior, this will be anesthetizing the superior alveolar arteries and nerves. Uh, by cuspid, you will be the middle superior arteries and nerve, and PSA will be the posterior <coughs> superior arteries and nerves. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the maxilla, you don't have to do <coughs> block. You're doing local, then you inject anesthetize. Now I'm um, infiltration distal and peripheral to the swelling. Swelling is here. This is Mar EX1, the Explorer. I'm going in now, I am surveying the bone, the cortical bone. Actually, I'm going with the Explorer, go right, go left, pull it out, push again, till I find a soft spot. Why? Because if you remember, you go back to this X-ray, see, I have a lesion. All right, okay. So I'm trying to locate the cortical bone, weak spot, eroded bone eroded bone. Once I have that, then that's going to create a drainage for the pus or exudation to come out. So we pushed here, pus. This is the incision. This is now done through the gingival tissue. This patient here had a swelling and she also had th this area. Now I want you to see, we put the rubber dam on. After we did IND, we got rid of the, the, the mess, patients have relief. We go in and we open the tooth with rubber dam. Rubber dam in place. Uh, no, here we got it, it later. And see what's coming out? The pus. Ask the patient to take their finger, her finger, his finger, and massage where the swelling is or massage where it hurts and they push. Amazing, many times you see that as they're massaging, you see more pus coming out. Evacuate this, this high suction. And after this, you start getting blood. And if you wait enough time, then you're becoming a clear exudation. In about, this in about 15 minutes, we were able to go from here to there, all right? When it is to this level, all right, I start cleaning the canals for this patient. All of these patients get antibiotics, all right? I'm gonna to go to the biotic at the end, all right? All right. Here's a palatal swelling, okay? Don't be afraid, all right? Your greater palatine bundle is right here. So you are fine here. The incisive canal is here. So this is an area in size and drain. Buccal swelling and the fistula. Buccal swelling, vestibule, vestibule, vestibule. See, all of them are vestibule. They are good prognosis because you could get to them, all right? Here again, we're seeing, we're going distal. All the work is distal. And then this is the swelling and that's the incision. All right. So what's the message we're getting? Drainage through the tooth is the key. If I give you a statistics, when you, when you have a case like this, 
90% of the relief comes from this action. 90% comes from opening the axis, draining and draining. If you give antibiotics, only 10%, it just basically, antibiotics is to, to prevent the spreading, but it doesn't help. The only thing helps the patient are two things, open the tooth or do IND. These cases, I did both. Incision first, then you could really anesthetize, and then you could do a lot of work. The beauty of this technique, incision and opening the tooth, you now you could actually, if you have the time, you could clean the canals, clean them as much as you want. You could even go to filling because you have a drainage. You created the drainage. But I don't have usually the time, so I don't do that. Just basically get them out of the pain. This is a case. I show you the slide here. It's exactly what happened. The minute we removed this temporary, we got this. The end of the root was in the mandibular, inferior mandibular vessels. There was so much blood, so much hyperemia at the end of the root that the minute we opened this, this blood coming out, of course, it's infected. So the efficiency of this, this was a heart swelling. This was indurated swelling, okay, that occurred after a long temporization. This was causing the pain. So many times, the minute you make the axis opening through the tooth or through the incision, this kept going on almost for about two minutes, blood coming out, actually gushing out. Of course, it was bus, but the exudation. And we'll talk about temporization. So best practice in surgical and non-surgical emergency, first is root canal drainage, number one. Anytime you can put the rubber dam on and open the axis and let the tooth drain, that is the best practice. Incision and drainage comes next. Surgical lancing is number four, antibiotics number five. All right? That's in sequence of, of helping the patient having the relief of the problem. Okay, another subject. What you see here is called trephination. In the United States, even abroad, there was a concept, and there is a concept, that patients like this, you have a lesion here, lesion there, lesion there, lesion there. For some reason, these patients had a root canal, okay? and the patients have pain, give them, still have pain. And see, what they did, they take a, a burr, drill burr, and there, there are some machines called fistulator, and they drill a hole at the apex, supposed to be trying to go to the apex. But in the process, they hit the root. Here, the target was this lesion. The dentist basically did this. The target was here on this tooth. The dentist hit the tooth next door. The canine, this is the lateral. Here, they, they hit the apical third and left the apex. Here, look what they, they did. All right. This is flapless, no flap. It's called trephination. Trephination is really a good procedure for areas you do not want to do surgery or you can do surgery. Okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. Dangerous, flapless. It's almost like doing implant, flapless. Forget it. The molar. Look. Lesion. This is. All right. So, this case, if you ask me which tooth scares me most in terms of root canal treatment to break instruments, to, to do damage, I would say to you, the mandibular second molar. Respect that tooth when you do root canal treatment. The thickness of the cortical bone, from the cortical bone to the root end inside, 
I have five to 11, 12 millimeters of bone I have to go through to reach the root canal. Here, two, three millimeters I am at the root, two millimeters, maximum two and a half. I drill, I'm in the root, I do my epico, I do retro, whatever I'm doing. The second molar is different. So this is the second molar and the patient had pain. I don't think I ever in my life retreated my own treatment. When I do, and then a patient have pain, I go in surgically. Let me repeat. I don't believe going back, remove the carapercha, okay, to, to relieve the pain. On the contrary, you add to the trouble. Especially if you did a good job condensing the gutta percha, doing a good job, whether you're using any kind of filling material, O4, O2, gutta percha, packing, whatever. So if you do a good job, which you're supposed to, it's going to be difficult to remove. And that job of removing the gutta percha is more trauma to a patient already in pain or have a beginning problem. Here, I, I, there's no lesion. Now, if I have a lesion here, it's going to make the job easy because the lesion erodes the, the bone so I could get to the lesion I am already in. The lesion already helps many times. The easiest surgery is when you have lesion. Here, I don't have a lesion. I know that I have to go through good bone to get to this area. No problem. Look, this is duty treatment. I haven't even finished. We did not do the buildup. And it happens. I got an overfill and I have patient with pain. All right? Okay. This is what I did. Lay a flap. This is a flap. Mike, this is now, you can see where we are. I'm trying to get to the mesial of mesial root of the second molar. You can see how much bone thick, look how thick the bone, look, look, look at that over here, okay? The first hole I made was here. I take an x-ray immediately. So I drill about one to two millimeters, one millimeter, two millimeters, and I take an x-ray. You will see it immediately. Here's the image right there. Oh, I'm wrong. So what do I have to do? In surgery, we used to use marker, the foil from an x-ray film. We put it and take an x-ray. So I know I need to go more distal and down. I have to go this way and down this way. So I go back. Here it is. This is the first one I made. Then I have to go back and down. So here it is, go down. I am right on target, right there. I drill. I could feel, then I take MRX1, the Explorer, which I talked about, and I put it there. It doesn't go. Then I take a DG16 Explorer, which also, and then I push it in. It goes. Then I take back the Explorer and then push. Push, right there. Don't worry about the mandibular nerve. The mandibular neurovascular bundle comes back from the third molar goes lingual to this tooth, way lingual, keep lingual and exit between the bicuspid and the first molar, exit here. So I have no mandibular nerve here, it's to the lingual, far to the lingual. Over here, I push with MAR-AX1, push, pull out, and I see pus coming right out, right from here. I got what I want. I don't have to do epico, I don't have to do anything in this level. I basically let it drain, put the flap back, give the patient antibiotic, and dismiss the patient. So this is called trephination. Trephination is to make a hole, to drill a hole, to affect the drainage. And that's what we did. It's a very simple you know, procedure to do. We did almost like a single flap, all right? Now, this is now we're talking about how to affect many times you give the things that help me in uh, controlling the patient is direct anesthesia on the organ itself. Right interpopal, you know all about that. Or periodontal, 
right in the see right in the PDL, inject right in the PDL. So when you're having a problem with the the block or whatever. Okay. Okay. Now I just want to leave a couple of points before I stop is on temporization. I told you earlier that when I temporize emergency or non-emergency, I don't use any medication. I have not done that, my God, all my life. What we do basically when we want to dismiss the patient, these are emergency cases, there's a bleeding. So we basically uh, use paper points to get the blood. Keep drawing with the blood till you get no more blood, all right? So dry the canal real good. All right, dry the canal, the root canal, read good. Of course, you already enlarged it and all that. The key, when that patient leaves the office, that root canal should be empty from anything in the canal. The only thing the canal has is the dressing. All right, this is what I mean. Of course, now we never leave teeth open, you know that. Never, when you leave teeth, we don't put it, you know, you want to drain, instead of it drains out, it drain, you pack the food and the bacteria in. So you got the patient bananas and steak and apples and chicken and McDonald's and all of that there, okay? Okay, now I just want to review this because I've seen people doing it, all right? Some people leave paper points in the canal. Some people put calcium hydroxide in the canal. Some people, some dentists put CMCPs. Some people use formicus, I don't know any kind of material. But most people use calcium hydroxide. I don't use anything. Don't leave a paper point like this because it gets swell. It's almost like you sealed the canal. So what do I do? I dry the canals totally. And then I put here new gauze. I pack gauze, no cotton. I actually pack gauze in the chamber, pack it real good, and then put the IRM or the uh, cabinet. So what I'm trying to do is do this. I create what's known as internal venting chamber. Internal venting chamber. What's the internal venting chamber? That I have here a lesion, or I'm gonna have inflammation. Inflammation, you're going to have exudate. The apex is open. So the exudation goes here. This is space. Goes up, goes up, goes up, goes up. And soak in the dry gauze I put in the chamber. The distal with the lesion goes up, 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 up. And then the nut cotton gauze and dries right here. Many of the cases, how I developed this technique, I put nothing, no medication in the canal, no calcium hydroxide, then nothing. Just dry canal and then a good, good gauze. I don't like cotton because cotton collapse and then the cavet or IRM sinks. You need solid dressing, layers of gauze. Soaks in, I go in, remove the temporary and I see these full with either blood or pus or moisture. Where it came from? Came back from here. So I created the drainage for this patient. I gave the patient, especially if the canal are prepped and ready to fill. I never fill when I prep. Never fill when I prep. I always prep, wait, and then I do fill and post. 75% of toothache is following preparation of the canal, all right? 25% or less is after putting the gutta percha. So you wanna take a chance. If the patients have pain, you go in, remove this, and you got drainage. That's the way I did my practice, and this is what I teach. So this internal venting chamber worked so well for me throughout the years. Dismiss the patient, and you see, I reduce the occlusion. I have, I don't recall I ever went back to my office to help a patient in pain. I prepare everything that I know what caused the problem. Occlusion caused the problem in teeth. So I reduce the occlusion, especially if your tooth needs crown. I have a good dressing so nothing goes into the canal. I have an empty canal system, so it will drain into the canal. 
if there is inflammation or a drainage. In terms of antibiotics, my favorite antibiotics for our problem in the donic bacteria is amoxicillin, 500 milligrams. My protocol, my philosophy, if you're gonna give antibiotics in cases of cellulitis, okay, you give them you, 500 milligrams, you hit them hard and short time. I have seldom given any antibiotics for a week. I don't recall at all. Most of my protocols, three days. The day of the treatment and a couple of days later, or the day you know, before, whatever. So a combination of uh, flagyl will be basically a mixture with the amoxicillin and metrozyadol, okay? These, but I use amoxicillin mostly. If the patient has severe, 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 I ask him to take two amoxicillin. If you have like cellulitis, you wanna hit them real hard twice. Uh, I mean, the first time 1,000 milligrams and then one every six hours. I don't wait eight hours. Okay, and this is the second antibiotics which has absolutely excellent, excellent uh, Zithromax. These are real good for cellulitis cases, advanced uh, uh, problems, all right? Okay, now. The other point here, those patients who we did we did the, all we've done today, we talked about a, HNA, we talked about emergency incision and all of that. One of the things that I discussed in my course, A to Z, surgical basics, one of the things that I do, and I, this is belong to today's lecture, okay, is one week, one week before the surgery, I see the patient and I prepare them for the surgery. I do what's known as a full mouth disinfection. I must do SRP, scaling and root planing on the whole mouth. I have seen implants next to calculus. I have seen unbelievable surgery next to calculus and plaque. Your patient gonna be surgerized you don't want the bacteria from one quadrant to come to your surgical site. The tissue you're gonna incise, the tissue you're gonna cut, the epico, the retro, the osseous scaling, the crown lengthening, the hemisection you're gonna do. These are surgically sensitive area. When they've been attacked by patient, by bacteria, not good. So the mouth has to be clean. How the mouth is gonna be clean? Bring them back, tell them, sorry, but you need to have scaling and root planing for the whole mouth. In the same time, scaling and root planing, you do it in one visit, two hours, whatever it takes, do the whole thing, okay? You or your hygienist, if you have hygienist, do that. In the same week before the surgery, so now we're talking about surgery we discussed in my other courses and what we did today, I want to do one week, that week, full mouth disinfection. What is a full mouth disinfection? Please learn this. They're going to rinse one minute with Peridex or Corsidine. That's 2% chlorohexidine, 0.2%. Okay? These are two of my favorite. This is the... This is the best thing to do for your perio patient, for your endo patient, for your dental hygiene patient, all right? These are the medication you wanna have. They're gonna gargle with it for 10 seconds, okay? All right? The last, they're gonna gargle with it one minute. They gargle, gargle one minute. The last 10 seconds, they try to make it reach their tonsils, okay? All that week, I want my patient to use interproximal brushes. I want absolute good oral hygiene before I cut that tissue. 
if you cut gingiva, which is not free of bacteria, not clean, it's going to bleed, it's going to lacerate, it's going to break down. You're going to have more bleeding during the surgery. When I have control of the tissue, I remove the inflammation, I remove the infection. Now I'm going to do the surgery. The tissue it looks beautiful. You could incise, you could see better. You're not going to have uh, the danger of tearing the tissue and all of that because some of the lifting procedure, the retraction or the gym could be some little, little traumatic. Okay, so they're going to have excellent oral hygiene for that week. Now, what's good about this? What's good about this is when you train the patient a week before your surgery, before your endosurgery, before your crown lengthening, before any procedure, you tell them, I want to do this, this, this a week before. And then the day after the surgery, continue for the next two weeks, three weeks. The patient already familiar. He's been educated a week before the surgery. It's easier to comply. And it becomes a habit. But when you do that, when you sit down and teach them, sit down, look them in the eye and say, this is fluorhexidine. It's beautiful. Bring some to your office. Put them in your office. Show them. Say, buy this from the pharmacy. Okay? This is how you use this. This is surgery. And you want it to be to go fast and efficient and atraumatic. And one of the best way to it is to have the patient psychologically prepared, the quadrant prepared by scaling root planning, and there's no time bombs next door. The patient mouth is clean and you deliver. You ready? You deliver. And that's the way I see it. All right? I hope we got a good job. It's a three o'clock. That's what we try to do today. All right? So what I would like to do now is, you know, spend the next, uh, you know, I have some slides from the internet, which I don't think I'd rather have some questions for you from you, if you like. Otherwise, we are in good shape. The first question is, what's the ideal time we should wait after crown lengthening? And the second question, can we do crown lengthening in one side only, distal area, for example? First of all, crown lengthening is a procedure absolutely not utilized sufficiently and many teeth are extracted because the general practitioner does, does not know how to do crown lengthening. Good question. First of all, I want you to know that every time we do root amputation, every time we do hemisection, we must do crown lengthening at the same time. And that is basically the osseous contouring at the amputation site and the osseous contouring on the remaining root, okay? That, that is essential because crown lengthening is gonna provide you the, the biologic width. You must have two millimeters 0.4, okay? After the crown margin before the bone, you get to the bone. That's essential. If the crown margins right at the bone, the bone is gonna run away. It's gonna resorb and then you're gonna have different problems. Now, concerning your question, so crown lengthening is a surgery, okay? And in my finalization, it comes to Perio and the, the section on uh, surgery in the finalization say, there is nothing called one side. Crown lengthening is on three. In other words, it has to be involving the tooth, but it and definitely the one next to it. So my flab, when I do a flab, I'm doing, you know, most of my surgery, as I told you, anterior, posterior, I'm not just reflecting the flab on one tooth. I'm reflecting the tooth on minimum tooth before and a tooth after. So you can't go, you know, why you need, you can't go high bone, low bone. You can't do that, especially in the anterior zone. Okay, this is why we, we basically created the concept of anterior flap from K2 
canine to canine, and posterior flap from canine to molars. Okay, this way, a small wound, one tooth wound, okay, one tooth wound or a flap heals as fast as six teeth flap. So don't think that if you make horizontal incision, three teeth is going to take more time. On the contrary, when you do quadrant dentistry, when you do dentistry next to the tooth in question, you find so many things. Okay, and and the more I do that, you know, throughout my career, especially when I came to the Middle East, okay, you know, scallop flaps and all of that. Majority, a lot of people when they have dentistry, or they have not taken care of them, they have diabetes, or they have also periodontal disease. So you need to get to the cervical zone. So going back to your question, no, we cannot do one side only of the tooth mesial or distal only. Second, the reason why crown gingivectomy died, nobody does gingivectomy. A good periodontist do not do, we, we not prescribe a gingivectomy. You must, because if you just do gingivectomy, the tissue is gonna grow back and you're gonna hypertrophy and you're gonna have more problem than before. You must, reduce the bone associated with a problem, okay? You must do that. But so you don't have a crown, you just basically contour. If the bone is thick, you thin it. If it's thick, like in the molar, second molar area, first molar area, on the buccal thick, you thin it. So you, you do biology contouring, you flow. You, you know, basically the same flow, same anatomy. This is why it's called biologic contouring. You bring it back to positive issue. If it's thin, you don't reduce as much, but you still have to contour the bone. So the answer, no, it has to be uh, mesial and distal, buccal and lingual, all right? And, you're, and then how long you wait? You could, now after you do the surgery, crown lengthening or any surgery, I need you to make a provisional, I mean, lab process provisional, good provisional, okay? To last at least 120 days, 120 days. Because after 120 days, the gingival tissue, the periodontal tissue stabilizes. But if you hurry up and put the crown, the final restoration, you know, like after four or six weeks, you're gonna have more recession and then you're not gonna be happy, all right? Or the patient won't be happy, depend on the crown you're using, metallic or no, nobody use metal as a crown or otherwise. So super gingival margins, you have no problem. But you know, if you have a super gingival margin, no problem. But if you did do the crown lengthening to go at, you need to wait. So in my protocol, the provisional goes for about one to two months, minimum 120 days. 120 days is maximum, but you need to get the patient back. Uh, I do the surgery. I see the patient next week to remove the sutures and then four weeks, okay? Put a new provisional, four weeks, I see the patient again, you know, modify the provisional, make a new provisional and let them go. And you give them instructions, much better. All right, so that's my, my answer. Uh, the second question is, what was the blue staining on the roots during uh, the surgeries? Okay. And what is used for? That's called methylene blue, okay? Methylene blue is, uh, it's a medical product. It's used in angioplasty, you know, when they do it for the heart. It's, uh, it's available as a dye, we use it as a stain. I use methylene blue, I, I cannot practice without it. In, in dentistry, in general dentistry, so anytime I have a crack, hairline crack, I have a fissure crack, and then I have fracture crack. Methylene blue, blue is a dye. You put one drop, two drops, 
on the dentin and the crown. And then if you have a crack, it will take the dye instantly. Okay. If the dye, if it's the deep track, uh, crack, you see a very blue, dark stain. This is in restorative dentistry. All right. In surgery, we lay the flap. Okay. You see the line, but that's enough. Even if you have a microscope, even if you have magnification, it's not enough. So when you put the dye, the dye leaks penetrate whatever the crack is. So you, then you see the line of the crack. So you know exactly where the extension of the, the crack. In epicoectomy, I also use it in epicoectomy. After I remove the bone on the root end, I get to the root end. Then we do bevel of the root end, you know, so you can see the whole root, not only the buccal aspect. Then we put methylene blue, rub it in real hard at the root end. You will see the periodontal ligament all thick blue. So you know now that your bevel is complete. Also, the methylene blue will go into the canal, any canal orifice which is not filled, it will take, it becomes a blue dot. If the main canal, your original canal, the main canal in the endodontic treatment is substandard or leaky, it will take the dye. If the gutta percha is very good and you have cement all dry and everything okay, you put the dye, you're not going to see the blue, blue circle. So it's basically absolutely essential for diagnostic surgery and for epicoectomy uh, and, and all of that. So it's a, that's what we use. It has to be sterile. Uh, it comes, uh, it's in the United States pharmacopoeia. It comes in ampules, okay? In ampules, it's pre-sterilized. You just put one drop. And I don't use cotton to apply it. You could apply it with a brush, which you use for composite, when you put the monomer on your primer. You could use that brush or you could use a new gauze, square new gauze, because you don't want fibers into the surgical site. So cotton is not, not very good. So use a brush to rub it with, or a small square, about half, one centimeter square of a new gauze that is fiber, fiber made glass. Yeah, okay. For third question, uh, does the crown lengthening affect implant success if the crown lengthening failed? Crown lengthening do not fail if they are well made. The crown lengthening does not fail if you basically done the, the osseous contouring and then you had the flap position cover. The, does the crown lengthening affect implant success? W what are we talking about? Implant success, crown lengthening on implants, you mean it's next door? The implant next, you mean the, the implant next adjacent to the crown lengthening? If you can uh, uh, clarify it, uh, Dr. Uh, Athir. Uh, uh, she said yes. It's, it's next to the implant. Hmm. Does it affect the implant? No. Yeah, I guess, yeah. No. No. And, and, and the question is interesting because if you need a, a crown lengthening next to a door implant, then that crown lengthening should be done as part of the implant placement procedure. Okay. You're looking into margin of what? Composite or amalgam? As a rule, as a rule, you could be at gingiva, at gingiva with gold, with amalgam, not with composite. Okay. I definitely recommend osteoplasty. Okay, doctor. Amen. Osteoplasty is very gentle, contouring, recontouring of the area. Yes, I prefer to have that bone level down, all right? And in, in those cases, this is not a complete surgery. You basically reflect 
what we call envelope flap, okay? Very minor, it's not a full anterior or a posterior. You basically expose the buccal and lingual of the area just to allow you to insert a round burr, slow speed, number four round burr, and just contour buccal and lingual and take a bone file and just file that area. By the way, very good question, Dr. Amen. Any flap, research have shown, the minute you do a flap and put the tissue back, bone is gonna resorb between one to two millimeters. So just exposing the area, you're gonna have some bone desorption. And the other thing I wanna tell you, I always say two things. I have never removed the crown and regret it because I always find things that I did not expect. And I have never reflected a flap and regret it because I always find things that I did not expect. Your x-rays lie all the time. Even CBCT lies. The only thing do not lie in dentistry is your eyes and your fingers when you see them direct. My, my concept, open and see, not wait and see, okay? Open and see. You will find things. So when you lay that, that envelope flap, just buckle and lingual, you see granulation tissue, remove it. The call, the call area, the call, C-O-L, between the buccal and lingual, it's the worst area. That's where you get the inflammation, okay? You wanna clean that. And if you are right, right your margin, your cavity class too right there, it's a service to the patient. It will be service to you when you put your composite, you don't have bleeding, and it's a service to the patient. So basically lay it down and then put back a temporary, let the patient go for about two, three weeks, heal fast. Um, if I have a patient with short, obturation or not ideal, no symptoms, no pain on percussion, no radiolucent lesion, is it mandatory to redo the RCT before crown? And does the new occlusion after crown delivery increase possibility of inflammation if we didn't redo the RCT? I mean, when we decide to redo RCT, if there is no signs and symptoms. Excellent. Experienced doctor asking a good question. This is my answer. The standard of care is standard root canal, one to two millimeters short of the apex. So being short, you can ask me how. If you short and well condensed, you are okay. But short how much? Two millimeters, be my guest. If you are out one and two millimeters, and the rest, the, the uh, gutta percha well condensed, be my guest, no problem, okay? But if you short and weak, the canal is not well condensed. That means you're gonna have micro leakage and you don't see micro leakage in x-rays, all right? You don't. So the answer to your question is the following. No symptoms doesn't mean anything. Pain is not in my dictionary, okay? My dictionary is biologic principles agreed on, guidelines we support, okay? Now, the biggest answer to your question is what you're gonna do. Are you gonna do a post? You are in trouble. The body could go for 10, 15 years, a balance between a, a post, a back, to, back root canal, okay, symptoms. But the minute you go back in and open that canal to do a post, you tip the balance against the body. The sleeping bacteria get up to fight you, fight. And that's when they're beginning. The minute you go back in to do the post of an old root canal, the one you described, you're contaminating the canal. And now you're gonna have a flare up and the flare up not gonna show 
the week you put the crown. This is going to show later. You could do a lot of things and your patient leave your office, pay his money or her money. Everybody happy, every smiling. It takes time to fail. It takes time to hurt. It takes time to develop region for pulp cabbing to fail, for root canal to disinfect or infect again. Okay, so don't look for pain as a criteria for your practice. Look for guidelines, all right? So if you're gonna do a post, my answer is do it again. But you see, doctor, this patient doesn't have insurance. This patient doesn't have money. I wanna do a service. This is my answer. Take an excellent, excellent head-on x-ray. Mean perpendicular, means the film perpendicular. I want no distortion, no angulation. A good PA and look for the lamina dura. Look for the periodontal ligament space around that tooth, especially at the epical third. If you see the lamina dura with that old root canal, with one of your description, you could venture. You could take another adventure. But no post, just a crown. <coughs> Don't get back in the pulp chamber. But if you see the lamina dura is changing or altering, then to me, you're beginning pathology, but you don't see it yet. So in the course on uh, how to become a diagnostician, I developed something called the 10 ADI, 10 ADI, 10 areas of diagnostic interest. The 10 ADI is basically looking at the pulp chamber, the canal orifice, the periodontal ligament, the lamina dura, the periapical bone, the periradicular bone, the alveolar crest, and the adjacent teeth. And you would check, 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 check. If all okay, you are fine. So my answer to you, use MTA. Use super EBA, use EBA, but don't use things that resorb fast. Our IRM reported good in the literature, but it resorbs with time. All right, so that's my answer. Okay, let's, let's take the last question before we can uh, proceed. Uh, most doctors said about vertical root fracture is a hopeless tooth, so you must extract it. What's your opinion, sir? Thank you so much. Extract the root, not the tooth. It's, that's why we have the course today. Okay. A central, uh, excellent question. I, I like to see who's, who wrote that question. Where is it? It's uh, Dr. Ayman Fayumi. Oh, again, same doctor. Good. Hmm. All right. He's asking good questions. Okay. Doctor, I have written, I also have material on the internet. Uh, on, I have a whole series on cracked teeth. My classification of cracked teeth is, first of all, first of all, it's called line crack. What's a line crack? A line crack is a line which you take a fine explorer and run through it, and the explorer doesn't catch. The explorer doesn't catch. That's a line crack. This crack you could treat, you could do don't make it, don't propagate it, don't make it worse. If your tooth has a crack, hairline crack in the crown, or even the pulp chamber, do biologic root canal, means a single cone clean canal, no post. When you make a crown, make it sub-occlusion, smaller occlusal table. The second definition, classification, aboras, is called fissure crack, fissure crack. What's a fissure crack? Fissure crack, if you take a fine explorer, DG16, double-ended explorer, and run it through the crack, okay, it catches. It catches, but doesn't separate. So when the crack doesn't separate, it's a fissure. All right? So run through. That one is worse than the line. The third one, Fracture crack. 
fracture crack. This is the crack that we're talking about. When you run the explorer, it actually goes in and you could move it and you see the segments are moving. In my interim presentation I did to you, most of the cases I saved, when I go in, I put methyl in blue. It takes the dye. I look at the bone on the mesial intact. I look at the bone and the distal intact. The lingual definitely intact. I lost only the buckle. That means the crack is only on the buckle. Oh, by the way, good cracks, good prognosis cracks, I call them non-contributory, they never make a pocket. A bad crack fracture make a pocket. So in that case, we talk about vertical. If you have a pocket, like with the case I showed you, okay, there was a pocket next to it, right? You go to the lingual, there was a pocket next to it because it's spread around. It's not IPP, it's destruction everywhere. So the crack that I'm talking about, most of them start at the apex, stop mid root. Okay, I remove apex and mid root. The rest is okay. That's the interim we talked about. Now, the, the issue of vertical oblique fractures, all right? How did you diagnose them? By surgery, then, then you do the test, you put methyl blue, take the explorer, it's two pieces. Of course, it's extraction, single rooted tooth. It's a molar, you amputate, you hemisection that portion. The, the answer to that question is the pocket. If you're crack, if you really have a fracture, you should have a pocket, 100%, okay? So, but if your attachment is apparatus is intact, all right, and you have pathology up there, teardrop lesion or what you call J-type lesion, okay, you need to do the, expl the exploratory surgery to look at it, all right? And at that time, you're gonna use the methylene blue. If methylene blue and you don't have the whole root, you could do epico or deep epico. Deep epico means you remove the epical third and just about mid root. Okay, that's that's the answer. Okay, we go. Uh, he said, can we soak the cotton in an aesthetic solution instead of placing it to dry? For temporization? Oh, oh I see what yeah. you mean, for the temporization. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> I have better for him. Again, good question. We have a good group today. <laughs> uh, really do. Yeah. Okay, I know what you're saying, my friend. Okay, put your cotton, it will collapse. I know you want to pack it better. Put one drop of sodium hypochlorite. Okay, you want to wet it. That's what, I've done that. Because you want to wet so it will pack. So put the cotton, rather get this new gauze. The new gauze has no fiber. And we cut them small pieces, small squares, and we pack them. And you could take an eyedropper, you know, and drop two points of sodium hypochlorite and pack it and then put the cavet or the IRM. So the answer, yes. But instead of an acida, you could use sodium hypochlorite, will kill more bacteria in the chamber. Good question. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is your most important medication. Remove this concept of sodium hypochlorite is an irrigant. No, sodium hypochlorite, not calcium hydroxide, is your, your medication. That medication, there is absolute bacteriological evidence that sodium hypochlorite 5.5% kills bacteria between 30 to 60 seconds. Okay? And so if I have it in the root canal system, the root canal anatomy for 45 minutes when I'm instrumenting, I'm enlarging, I'm preparing the canal and it's going into all the fine dental anatomy, we're doing a great job. We are basically cleaning the canal system, the lateral, the fins and the fissures in the canal with sodium hypochlorite. So I'm not irrigating anything. So I'm using it as a medication. I don't put anything in the root canal anymore. I have not done that since the 70s. We wrote an article back in 1978 about changing trends in Indo, published in the American Dental Association. 
1978, doctor, we expected, Dr. Frank, Dr. Glick, I wrote the article with them. We published it in the ADA. We expected many of the things happening today that you do not need to culture. You do not need to medicate. There's a lot of things we expected, thank God, we predicted. Predicted simplification of endo. We don't want to complicate endo. We don't want to complicate surgical endo or non-surgical endo. Because it's, it's a service. You know, it's, it's something good. Something good. Extraction is no good. Okay, Prof. Uh, um, uh, the other question is, why do you avoid using calcium hydroxide in your practice? Calcium hydroxide was used for pulp capping, uh, so to say, to build a bridge or calcification of the pulp. Later on, there was a lot of research done in which they compared Z ZOE with calcium hydroxide, and some people put wax, some people cut, put cotton pellet, some people put nothing in, in pulp cabin research was done years ago. I, I survived that period, okay? Um, and then all of the results of the research come, no significant difference. That's universal. No significant difference between group A and group B or one and two and three. And then later on, we found that you actually, all you need is a good healthy pulp to recover itself. Later on, calcium hydroxide, we found that it has an ability against tissue is toxic, actually destroys cells when it comes in contact with tissue, all right? So indirect pulp calving one thing, but direct pulp calving, they found pulp necrosis layer when it's used in direct pulp calving. And a lot of people rejected it as a pulp calving material, finished. Then came the era, the Scandinavian country, the researcher, excellent researchers, there was commercial product. You could see behind many articles, there's always a commercial product trying to promote. Calcium hydroxide then used in endodontics for a pacification. They clean the canal, put calcium hydroxide to have the root end continue. In case you have a young adult, the tooth is incompletely formed. And this is called the Frank technique. They put calcium hydroxide in the canal and they change it every week, every two weeks, okay, to have regeneration. The research done with that calcium hydroxide, they also got the same results. The idea is clean the canal and don't let anything in them. Calcium hydroxide, so we did a lot of work also on large APCs, large canals. Then came research after that. It shows that for me, I don't use calcium hydroxide for one reason. I don't need it. I do not need it because calcium hydroxide, after 24 hours later, it's nothing but junk, powder. Calcium hydroxide efficiency only when it is in contact, it has 24 hours, 48 hours. After that, it's useless. More than that, more than that, calcium hydroxide in the canal, all right, in the canal, it creates a smear layer I cannot remove from the canal walls. I've done a course in Mexico, a surgery course. We did Epico and a lot of failures, okay? I'm really glad you asked this question. When we did Epico, failing case, we see gutta percha and around it a layer of what? Calcium hydroxide used as a dressing. Many times you cannot remove the calcium hydroxide you put in as a medication. <coughs> it gets neutralized after two days, three days, one day, whatever, in, into the canal. So it creates me is another step I have to do. And what are you getting? That calcium hydroxide is not going to, you, you, 
What kills bacteria, okay, is your sodium hypochlorite, not your calcium hydroxide, okay? So in my, in my opinion, it's, it's unnecessary step. Putting in the canal, the canal walls, the apex is closed or very close, nothing, nothing is gonna happen. So what you are worried about, uh, okay, oh, I'm worried about leakage from the crown. You're addressing. You should spend more time in doing good temporary more than anything else. That's what you need to prevent pain and complication. If you do a good pelvic extirpation, canal enlargement, and you don't want your patients to have pain, okay, reduce the occlusion, do a very good provisional. What I mean by that, you put the cotton or square, whatever, close it, and use temporary data, do not. I have used composite so many times as a provisional between visits, composite. Because I have the, 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 the material down here, the gauze, okay? And I have, I don't acid etch, just put composite, cure it, okay? It creates a very good temporary, expensive, but we did it. So the idea of calcium hydroxide in the canal is a Scandinavian thing, all right? It's not an American thing, all right? and in terms of medication, again, my medication is what I use when I work. All right, that's the answer. Um, difficult, difficult, difficult to clean after you have it there. All right. Uh, can we use antibiotics in canals instead of using it systematically? Absolutely not. Okay, this is uh, what Dr. Grossman advocated in 1948. And uh, he developed uh, a whole bunch of antibiotics uh, put in the canal. Absolutely, you do not need it. You do not need it, doctor. The whole idea, you know, I used to say that, and I'm sure what's important is what you remove from the canal, not what you put in the canal. This is something we always shared with people. No, you do not need antibiotics in the canal, no. Um, again, again, um, I did uh, uh, a survey of the literature. You know, not, today is not research day, but actually I surveyed uh, all the endodontics works in the kingdom. By the way, uh, the, the uh, kingdom, is doing excellent job, excellent job, especially on the graduate student levels. They're doing a lot of research all over the country, in Indo, Imperio, in uh, uh, Ortho, public health, everywhere. And uh, I reviewed almost every article uh, published in the kingdom. The kingdom is the first country in the Arab world in terms of research in dentistry. And that's good, that's excellent. And hopefully the quality improve. And what I'm trying to say to you, I did survey all the research done about the practices. Um, um, we have big problems in the root canal treatment in the kingdom. There's a lot of substandard endodontics. The, the percentage of epical periodontitis uh, according to research done in Medina Menora, Tiba, Tiba, Tiba University, uh, they did a great job. And amazing, the percentage of epical periodontitis in that city, in that area where they did the research, uh, was in this 60%. The incidence of lesions in endodontically treated teeth, bad substandard endo between 50 to 60%, that's the highest number I've seen. I've seen it 40, 50%. Epical periodontitis, lesions, abscess, in normal population, if you have a patient with dead pulp, create a lesion, the percentage should be no more than one and a half to 5%. But because people are doing bad root canals, okay, the percentage of AP, Epical periodontitis 
associated with bad endo, bad endo, all right, is between 26 to 40 percent internationally. You know, I I read studied about it in Sudan and Libya, but the kingdom is the best research. There's some excellent periodontal research done in Jeddah University, King Abdul Aziz uh, University Imperial. There's a lot of good survey. So we have a lot of information available. The problem is not enough to do surveys. You need to do action. People are tired of surveys, research. You know, talk about the percentage of caries in the kingdom. Survey, survey. We need treatment. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. So in the Indo to say, uh, I've seen people using CMCP, they're using uh, is one, it is one using nothing out of survey of hundreds of people survey, one saying nothing, I don't use anything in the root canal. He was the only one right. So imagine that you have hundred people and only one is right. And that's I always say, you know. Sometimes one is right and everybody is wrong. Unfortunately, all right? And how do you know that? Because that person, if you really look into it, you'll see that he really studied the literature and knows what works with physics, okay? So uh, there's a lot of practices in endodontics in the country here, our own. Do you know that we used to, in America, culture, culture, Medicaid, culture. Do you know why they had five, six multiple indo, multiple visit indo? Because they used to medicate before they removed the tissue. So they put some medication in the chamber. Next visit, they remove the pulp in the chamber. Medicate again, then go to the cervical zone. As they're going down, they medicate and bring the patient. So the multiple visit endo came from culture, Medicaid, and be sure that culture is negative. And why did they do that? They did that at a time of focal infection. They wanted to prove to the medical profession that dentists can make sterile canals. You never make a sterile canal. And it's unfortunate that some of these practices are still available to today. And uh, so many of these things we learn uh, for some reasons, okay? And th the message I'm trying to say to you, okay, that many practices, the complicated endo, endo is so simple. Endo is a surgical field. You have tissue which is inflamed or dead, the product, you need to remove it, disinfect, and close. You could do that in one visit. You could do that in two visits. You could do that in three visits. You could do that in seven visits. But if you're really competent, you know what you're doing. You could do it fast and efficient. Don't do it fast and bad. Do it fast and good, all right? And unfortunately, many of the things became commercial and, and so on and so forth. But anyway, I enjoy talking like that. <laughs> I hope. I didn't burden you. All right. What sure. are you working on right now? What What's the plan? What's the next step for courses and programs from a prof over us? Oh, uh, you know, I am prosthodontist. I studied prosthodontics at Pittsburgh. I have a master's degree in prosthodontics. And then I didn't like lab work. So, uh, I took Indo because I like biology, I like surgery, I like all of that. Then I went to Pittsburgh again for Indo, completed to PhD, and then God, alhamdulillah, we came to the kingdom, Prince Abdurrahman bin Abdulaziz, God rest his soul, Allah yarham. came to the military hospital and I did this AAGD. I want the kingdom people to know that when Prince Abdul Rahman did the advanced education, uh, AAGD, advanced education in dentistry, in education dentistry, AAGD, 
There were four of them in America, and the fifth was in Kingdom. They were all one year AEGD program in America, and we did one year, two years. So we were the first one in the world to do two years. That program, the Advanced Education General Dentistry, purpose was to make the GP advanced, advanced education in general dentistry with a beautiful tone to take a GP who is the most important person in that team and make them advanced, state of the art, the best in everything. We did that. We trained 170, 180. Then the Saudi board of restorative dentistry started after us maybe with the year. We came here in 1999, 2000, we started that. In that course, I found that indo -perio resto is all what's important to the general practitioner. Okay, so every general practitioner must be competent in indo, must be competent in perio. They are the foundation, and on top of that, you put resto. So that's what that's what uh, we are working at Cashel to to do short programs, you know, very difficult to do programs again, you know, like AEG yeah. rules and all of that. But basically, courses in mini AEGD is which focus indo, perio, all of that. That's that's the backbone. This is the triangle. I call it the triangle. That's the triangle. That's interesting. In terms of clinical, all right. But the others is basically diagnosis. Uh, GP must be very strong in diagnosis, very strong, because they must know. Because when you talk to your specialist, you know what to expect. When you send a case, you expect it back. You need to know what did they do? What did they do to standards? So you must know the standards of that specialty. And that's so easy today. You know, American Dental Association. Everything is laid out, okay? So there's a lot of education to be done. And what we're trying to do now is do this. Uh, we're planning to, uh, to put three months program, short program in uh, advanced. We, we, we're gonna call it the 3M AGD. Uh, uh, so three months in advanced general dentistry. Yes, three months. Oh, great. In, we're planning something like that with the Saudi council, inshallah, okay? As a specialized professional program. Uh, yeah, it was a short yeah. course. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. That's interesting. I, I, I'm interested in technical clinical skills. It's nice to have a certificate, absolutely, you know. But yeah, to, to me, education, the, the content, the content of education. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. I guess uh, there are no uh, more questions. We have some comments. Thank you for this uh, amazing, informative session from Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Osama said, Prof. Marwan, you have a nice smile, mashallah. Allah bless you. <laughs>